News File is brought to you in association with MTN. Everywhere you go. Bank of Africa, as strong as a group, as close as a partner. Where Duraplas goes, water flows. Star Assurance, your solid partner. Ghana's most useful app. Hubsell is everything you. This is the St. Thomas Eye Hospital and get advice on which treatment works best for you. Think wood. Think fern art. Hello, good morning and welcome to Newsfile. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, we put Ghana first. Now, this week, you may have seen the footages and heard the voices of kids who spend school hours picketing, joining their pensioner bondholder grandma to picket at the Ministry of Finance in the hope that they will get school fees so they can return to school. Retired soldiers, retired police officers express their frustration, particularly about the fact that they can't afford their medicines after years of service to the country and having given their money to the government to keep for them. Dual citizenship. If you are Ghanaian and hold another citizenship in addition to that, Ghana's constitution bars you from holding setting offices. John Dramani Mahama made the news making a promise that he will revise that position. As we know, there's already a private member's bill pushed by Professor Kweku Asari through an MP for this to be done. How soon will this be done? And why must it be done? The security services, have they become employment warehouse for party loyalists? It does appear that even after the official commentary adverse to that kind of culture, it's still going on with John Mahama promising party people that they will be fixed in the security services what's the danger we'll be right back to deal with the vex matters i'm samson ladi anyanini <laughs> Close your window small. Ah, your room be too bright, oh. Why, you be vampire where you know the like sunlight. Oh, my guy, my eyes, oh, my eyes. Behind the PC problem. Oh, in the sun problem. Come on, light bulb, sir. This no matter. Eh? I beg, go Robert and Sons. Mm. Oh, yeah. The magic to him, I know correct. Cra. Where Robert and Sons sort them out sharp. Now, so so stylish frames in the wrong. <laughs> we go go Robert and Sons right here. No, I was sitting inside proper. For over 25 years, Robert & Sons continues to provide specialist eye care for both adults and children. Locate us at Adabaka, Adenta, Kumasi, Usudangwa, Tema, Weja, and East Legon. Call 050-151-9111. Robert & Sons, seeing is believing. Since inception, Ghana's economy has grown Almost 100% of Ashesi University students have found jobs, started businesses, or gone on to graduate school within six months of graduation. From Accra to Nairobi, London to New York, Ashesi graduates are noticed, and they are leading successful careers. If you dream of a rewarding life and career, 
and Ashesi Education prepares you for just that. Learn more about applying to Ashesi at www.ashesi.edu.gh. Today, I know hold. Make I give you the latest fella. Coca Cola changed my price. Oh, but the new The price for the 300 ml Coca Cola classic plastic bottle is now five Ghana cedis. The 300 Coke Zero, Fanta, and Sprite plastic bottles are also going for just four Ghana cedis. That will be all of the 1.5 Coke classic plastic bottle is 20 Ghana cedis. The same size 1.5 Coke Zero, Fanta, and Sprite plastic bottles sell at 18 Ghana cedis. Keep enjoying your favorite Coca Cola at the best prices with friends and family. This advert is FDA approved. Charlie, you sure see be diehard football fan who can't get enough of the beautiful game? Then stay connected to DSTV because it's a football festival. Live Ankasa. All the big leagues and tournaments day DSTV. UEFA Champions League, the Premier League, and La Liga all day. So my guy, don't miss a single moment of the action. Make you watch players like Haaland, Rashford, Benzema, Sadio Mani, and Thomas Partey battle it out. And may yet the dead, dead. Miss like it. Get your decoder for 269 Ghana CDs or dial star 759 hash to Connect and join the excitement. DSTV, it's your moment. When you are born from Ghanaian soil, you are born rich. Rich in who you are. With natural Ghanaian richness inspired by Mother Nature herself. Just like our premium water. With natural minerals that create pure premium mineral water. Made right here by the same Ghanaian soil that made you. Vaultic, own your richness. Vaultic. A product of the Coca-Cola Company. This advert is FDA approved. These NGOs are supporting government's efforts, not the opposite. We have developed a very effective cycle of admitting and rehabilitating young women in need. I don't want to be a student. I don't just want to be in the program. I want to be by your side. Get her ready. You're saved and you're brought here to make something of yourself. Only rule is that you stay as good girls. Investigations will focus on organizations with a seemingly clean sheet. You will fail. You know why? Because I'm leaving us. Supernatural Empowerment Summits 2023. Meet the Revivalists, the heads of global denominations and the Kingmakers. This year, in Archbishop Charles Ogenesari's 40th year in a miracle ministry and the then Supernatural Empowerment Summit, expect life-changing insights for ministry and impartation for the next level. Host and speaker, Archbishop Charles Ogenesari, other speakers from Ghana, Dr. Robert Ampia Kofi, Apostle Eric Namiche, Reverend Dr. Stephen Bwengo, and also Bishop Joseph Imakando, Zambia, Bishop Joseph Matera, USA, Apostle Yves Castano, Congo, Apostle Abraham Gaji, Côte d'Ivoire. Date, Monday 22nd to Friday 26th, May 2023. Time, evening session, 5.30 p.m. daily. Morning session, 8.30 a.m. daily, start on Tuesday. Venue, Perez Dome, Jonglu Junction, Accra, Ghana. Contact, plus 233-548-633-650. Or www.scsummits.org. Supernatural Empowerment Summit 2023. Score HD, the new exciting football channel, is now available only on HD Plus and brings you football from around the world. Watch Sadio Mane and Daniel Kufitre in the top weekly match of the Bundesliga 1 and EFB Cup, Primera Liga, Copa de la Liga Profesional, Si Ronaldo in the Saudi Pro League, as well as daily sports news every other hour. Also, get updated on Messi and Mbappe on PSG TV and many more. Feely Feely on HD Plus Channel 151. Agronaede, HD Plus, the Feely Feely experience.
Welcome to News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here is Samson's take. It's Act Professionally, Stop the Abuse, Part 5. Now, every responsible police commander I have known since I started driving only some 20 years ago has confirmed the law and cautioned against officers impounding vehicles on account of a driver's inability to produce a driver's license upon demand for inspection. Yes, no commander or even low rank officer with sound knowledge and up to the task interprets the law so poorly and so very embarrassingly. And sometimes we know, just for the purposes of extracting and extorting that five CDs, 10 CDs, 20 CD notes. The DVLA has shown integrity and respect for the people they serve by admitting that the threat to impound vehicles of drivers who are unable to produce their license for inspection was an error. They say it was a genuine mistake. They have clarified that that statement they issued was wrong. It was an error to have added Regulation 158 to Regulation 47. Yet some police officers are doing this. You are doing the job for the DVLA. They continue to abuse people, making impounding vehicles their default action over license inspection. Director of Driver Training, Testing, and Licensing at the DVLA. What a consummate professional Kafui Semevo is. He won many hearts with his demeanor and the integrity of his communication when he made the admission and gave the clarity on the Super Morning Show. I just love public officers who demonstrate the appreciation that theirs is service to people and facilitating easy enjoyment of services by the people. In fact, I drove straight to their premium offices and after my day in court that day to renew my license. Now, what does this regulation 47 of the Road Traffic Regulations 2012 LI2180 say? I'm sharing it with you. Let's read together. That's my copy. I've done something to it. It is so clear that I don't see how some of the errant police officers try to import Regulation 158 into it. Impounding vehicles for wrongful parking, for the vehicle not being roadworthy upon examination, 
It's not the same that this particular regulation requires. This regulation is very clear. And please, let's all comply with the law. It says, a person driving a motor vehicle shall, while driving, while driving at all times, carry that person's original driver's license. Carry the original. Don't carry photocopies so some police officer will have trouble with you. Now, in this age of technology, if they are having a copy or an image of their driver's license on their phone and they show it to you, I don't see why you should be angry. What you need is not the card, but the information on the card. Dear police officer, what you need is the information. And if he shows you they have a scan copy, or even it's a photocopy, and he shows you the information, why do you deal with them the way you behave? It is only the gun and the uniform that separates you from that person you interact with on the road. So here it is. Carry your original, please, Ghana people. Your police people don't want trouble. Carry the original so that you don't have to pay five CDs or 20 CDs and 50 CDs. It says, a person driving or in charge of a motor vehicle on a road shall, on the request of a police officer in uniform, please note that they must be in uniform, or an authorized officer of the licensing authority produce a driver's license that authorizes that person to drive the motor vehicle for inspection. For inspection. That's all you have to do. Inspect and give, them, give it back to them. Now, the provision you have been misconstruing is sub-regulation 3. Despite sub-regulation 2, a police officer in uniform may request the person to produce within 24 hours the driver's license of that person to that officer at a designated police station or to another police officer as may be directed by the officer. This one doesn't say you have a discretion in giving them 24 hours. The discretion here is about where they should bring it within 24 hours. That's the discretion you have. Not that you have a discretion to grant them to bring it within 24 hours or not. Now see the emphasis of the lawmaker in sub-regulation 4. Where a person driving a motor vehicle is required to produce a license, a certificate, or a document relevant to driving the motor vehicle, that person shall, shall, mandatory, that's what our interpretation act says, produce it immediately. So that's the first step. Once the police officer or the licensing authority asks you to show your license, produce it immediately, right there and then. Or, or please, it is within immediately or within 24 hours of being required to produce the license, certificate, or document. So you don't have a discretion in it. If they can't produce it immediately, you give them 24 hours. Take the address. That's your business. Find out where you can locate them. The default should not be to impound the vehicle because reading through all of this, there's no impounding of the vehicle for you to do. And finally, sub-regulation five, a police officer in uniform and not below the rank of an inspector may where necessary Retain the driver's license. You didn't say retain, retain the vehicle. Oh, retain the license for the period that the license is required and shall issue an official receipt for the retention. Check that. You just collect it and you ask them to go. You must issue them a receipt for the retention of that license. So, uh, regulation 158 has nothing to do with this. Regulation 158 says that when you park your vehicle wrongly, unattended, they should impound it or tow it to their offices. When 
upon examination. That's not a question of inspecting a license. This one is about the license. Regulation 158 is about the item, the vehicle itself. It says when they pack it wrongly or when you, ins you examine it, examination, when you examine it, and maybe their lights are not working, their brakes are faulty, or something of the sort, then you may impound it discretionary. You may impound it until the issue has been resolved. The guys are sphincters. On Monday, you arrested this guy. You took his license and impounded the vehicle in addition. You ask him to show up in court on Thursday. He shows up in court on Thursday. Your excuse to him is that, oh, uh, because of certain things, you couldn't register the case for court. So he should come next week. His vehicle is still with you. What is this? Why are you abusing the uniform that they pay for? You have done the same thing to other people. You don't do that. Please, let's stop this barbaric conduct and act like we are civil and civilized. Thank you very much. That will be my take. A shaman is still on my mind. Until that blight is addressed, blight is addressed, this democracy is but a sham. That's my take. We'll be right back to deal with the issues with my guests. Small. Ah, the room be too bright, oh. Why, you be vampire where you know they like sunlight? Oh, my guy, my eyes, oh, my eyes. Behind the PC problem, oh. in the sun problem. Come on, light bulb, sir. This no matter. Eh? I beg, go Robert and Sons. Mm. Oh, yeah. Then my chick to him, I know correct. Crap. Where Robert and Sons sort them out sharp. Now, so, so stylish frames in the wrong. <laughs> we go go Robert and Sons right there. No, I was sitting inside proper. For over 25 years, Robert & Sons continues to provide specialist eye care for both adults and children. Locate us at Adabaka, Adenta, Kumasi, Usudangwa, Tema, Weja, and East Legon. Call 050-151-9111. Robert & Sons, seeing is believing. She's so close to the boss, they whisper. The PA is so lucky. They think it's only 9 a.m. and you've already gone through three meetings, 12 phone calls, and a low calorie breakfast. You only survive each week thanks to speed lunches and power naps. It makes you wonder hmm, how many steps have I taken up the corporate ladder? But you've got this. Wake up your fame with Lucas because with Lucas you always make it through. Lucas restore your energy. This advert is FDA approved. Due to special request, your free basic health screening at the Bank Hospital is now extended to weekends, Mondays to Saturdays, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Just walk into the Bank Hospital cantonments with your spouse and kids if you're registered under these reliable health insurance plans for free basic health screening. Glyco Health Insurance, TPA, Ultimate Platinum, Platinum Plus, and Enhanced Plus. Metropolitan Health Insurance, Burgundy, Champagne, Red Classic, and Tecoris Plans, Nation Wide Health Insurance, Premium Plus, Premium and Privilege, Gab Health Insurance, Premium, Premium Plus, and Premium Plus Plus, Phoenix Health Insurance, Platinum, Comprehensive and Standard, Vitality Health Insurance, TPA, Premier Care, Super Care, Top Up Executives. Slots are running out, so call now or send a text to secure your slot ahead on 0599 700 080. The Bank Hospital is located at Cantonments near Nafti, Accra. When you are born from Ghanaian soil, you are born rich. Rich in who you are. With natural Ghanaian richness inspired by Mother Nature herself. Just like our premium water. With natural minerals that create pure premium mineral water. Made right here by the same Ghanaian soil that made you. Vaultic. Own your richness. Vaultic. A product of the Coca-Cola company. This advert is FDA approved.
Yare. So over big danka, it was serene environment with ultra modern facilities. Na sa oju she yechu akwanya, there was painters, Coca Cola runabout, close to Fidelity Bank, stand chart in Chironuma. I'm speaking now, I may refer to uh, who, to even undergo some uh, medical checkup. And because of money issued, I've not gone yet. It's, 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 it's very painful for a police officer serving this country for almost 35 years. And the little I had for that, my stay worship and to be what taken by the government in fact it's very disastrous my grandma doesn't have money to pay my school fees for me and so they'll suck me out of the school when my grandma hasn't paid my school fees so today i'm here for my grandma's money so that she can pay my school fees for me so that i can go to school but in the future, I can be a police. Do you know who is who is holding your grandma's money? Yes. Who, who is holding your grandma's money? Nana Akufuadu. So if you meet him one-on-one -on -one today, what will you tell him? I tell him that I want my grandma's money back for her. Because we are planting the house, and then my grandma can buy food for us to eat when she doesn't have money. I sold a family property. I feed several old women. I pay school fees for several young children. If I have a heart attack or stroke, I will die. Already I'm taking diazepam. Is it right to sleep at night because I have panic attack? My heart will start poop, 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 like this. Then I have to hit my chest. Then I take my diazepam. Is this right? Could have gone on a route march, but look at us. Drinking some water. During those days, when I was in the Ghana Armed Forces, for well, a period like this, no water was required. But for this little duration, you see, I'm holding water, drinking water, because the body has been used, used, and I would say, by the government. For almost 40 years, over 38 years that I served the Ghana Armed Forces, during my time, I did my best. And my best was among the best, both within the country and outside the country. The missions that I went to, Liberia, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, all these places, I didn't feel the country. I did not feel the country. And I'm expecting that the country at this stage of my life will not fail me. Dr. Edu Ananianchi, thank you very much for joining us on Newsfile this morning. Thank you, too. Right. So, Dr. Edu Ananianchi is a convener of the Pensioner Bondholders Forum. Um, can you tell us why you are still, you are back at the finance ministry premises picketing um, with retired soldiers, retired police officers, that grandma with their granddaughters who are spending school hours uh, picketing at this place instead of being in school. Why, why, are you, why are you back there? You were exempted. The finance minister exempted you, so you shouldn't have any problems. Well, uh, that's, that's true. We were exempted. And as I, I kept on explaining, I believe the government or the minister knew, or even if he didn't know, uh, I have explained several times the meaning of issuer exemption. So once you grant the issuer exemption, you must know that you have to prepare your cash flow in such a manner that as soon as the payment is due, you pay. This is your obligation to do. When we got this issuer exemption, we have been waiting, waiting, waiting. Anytime the payment delay, we write to government, we issue press release, once in a while, government will come and make some one or two payments and, and go and, and rest somewhere, tell you 
I will come some other day. It doesn't even tell you when the other day is coming. Why is it why I come and pay? So we gave a letter after a series of complaints. We finally have final letter to the ministry. It was dated 30th March, where we said if by 21st April all our standings have not been paid and their standings are both coupons and principals, if they are not paid by 21st, we would resume the picketing. We had some engagement with the ministry and we decided to add one more uh, week to the 21st and made it 28. Since that we gave that uh, one window, one week uh, window to make it 28, that was on the 14th, we never heard from the government. 28 came, we haven't heard anything, no payment. So we informed the police that we were resuming the picketing. We don't have to give the police uh, uh, five days uh, Notice we, we went to the police with a letter on 28th mm. of uh, April and said we're going to uh, reconvene, uh, resume on the 8th of May. And so 8th of May came and we had to be there to ensure that we get all the outstanding payments, which are the coupons and the principals. So that is why we are back. So cumulatively, for how long have the payments been overdue? Um, and what are you being told? Well, as at the start of the picketing on Monday, we had 19 coupons outstanding, and then three principals. And you see, as soon as we give the letter to the police, we send the letter to the police on the 28th. There's somewhere around Thursday, Friday before the Monday of the start, uh, the start of the picketing, we saw that some payment has started trickling in. Uh, and we believe that was for a second March, and that of uh, six March. Then Monday, the Monday that we started the picketing, also in the evening, uh, some people saw ad uh, alerts on their phone uh, that some money has started trickling in for. 20th one, uh, those that were due on 20th. And so that was the, 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 the since then we haven't heard any, we haven't seen any alerts of uh, other payments. So if we were dealing with uh, 19 at the time and we saw about three coming in, at the time we started, hopefully you can see now there is 16 more that has not been uh, addressed at all. Mm. And then as we move along, uh, further payments and further uh, uh, coupons were also maturing. For example, by tomorrow, two more coupons will be will be due. So, as at the time that we were, were starting, that, that was the, the okay. situation. Um, we, we are not happy that you are going to have to be picketing at this place uh, because you don't deserve this. Um, we are looking into our future, you know. Uh, in this country, and we don't want to be treated in, in a similar way. Um, yet, I find it most unfortunate that we have left you guys to be there alone. This is not, should not be you alone because your money is directly affected. So, I've heard you suggest that there is a way the government can end this situation. Of course, the government is also in difficult situation. You say the government should borrow to pay up? Yes, that is a suggestion I give. And uh, I think the government is following uh, through with that. Uh, yesterday, after the picketing, we were invited into a meeting around 12.30. We had all gone, so I had, again, uh, the, 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 the invitation will not come until the, the, the whole uh, 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 Pricing or the, the, the picketing has ended at 11. So 12.30, we went in, we waited, we waited, but finally, this meeting, we were supposed to have, have it uh, the Thursday, but the Thursday evening, we went there, stayed for a long time, up to getting to six, and we said, well, the two of us that went, we are all growing, and we need to go home early, take our meals, and uh, take your medication, uh, before it's too late. So we left the premises of the ministry, getting to six o'clock and went home and said, well, let's make it the next day. We're thinking in the morning we will be called. We weren't called until getting to uh, 
12, about after uh, by 11.30, that they called us that we should come for the meeting at 12.30. So we waited. I had four, three more people who were still around to wait for me, mm. uh, for me to go. So we went in. Uh, the meeting was called by the Minister of State, uh, Dr. Neil Adam. And we had a lengthy discussion. And what we had agreed on is that the, the government is going to uh, pay all the outstanding coupons on Monday. Okay. Including, including the coupons that will be due on Monday. Monday 15th, two more coupons will be due. And that is going to be added to the ones that are, are been due for over 60 days, 50 days, 40 days to be paid. All right. So we were going to give instruction to the uh, agents to start the payment. And we believe that so, we are even so thankfully, right. thankfully, and, thankfully, we are not returning. We are not going to see these yes, sites anymore. Yes, yes. So we said, well, uh, the idea is to ensure that we don't uh, continue with that. Nobody wants it, but you see, uh, we we're, were forced to do that. So the coupons only are going to be paid uh, from Monday. Monday, they are going to settle everything that is due up to the Monday. Uh, however, the uh, principal, three principals due, we are still engaging government uh, to see how that can be paid. That has not been resolved. And then government also has assured us that it would get, one of the things we're complaining is that the normal pay us as and when it is due. Right. And government is undertaking to do that. As soon as the subsequent coupons are due, it, it pays so that we don't come back to the picketing. So we met with these, uh, we met yesterday night okay. forum, and we said, well, let us give government some space. Was, let's show that we also care if it says it's going to pay on Monday. Okay. Let's suspend our picketing for next week. So mm -hmm. from Monday up to Friday, we won't be there. And All then right. uh, we will see what will happen during the week in terms of the payment and the arrangements that we have to make with government on the uh, outstanding principles. If all things go well, then there will be no picketing. But if we, we hit some rock again, then of course we will, we will, we will come back. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Eduan Anienchi, for your time this morning on News File. And uh, thank you for uh, ending this on a rather, you know, refreshing note, hoping that the government will keep its part of the bargain. Um, here in the studio with me right now and he'll be joined by um, others to help us discuss the issues that we have table to discuss for you this morning. Dr. Kwame Asasante is Senior Lecturer, Department of Political Science and Director Center for European Studies, University of Ghana, Legon. Doc, thank you very much for sacrificing your time to be with us this morning. Good morning. Yes. Um, what would you say about what is going on with the pensioner bondholders? Um, I'll be frank with you. It's been very difficult for me. When I heard the kids, heard their grandma, and listening to the retired police and military officers, it was really heart-wrenching. The same way that I feel, very, very unfortunate. Why am I saying that? If you look at, at these people who have really served their state and served their state well, and there's a time for them to rest and then organize their homes and they are in such difficulty, then it's a problem. Another problem is also the fact that here you are, these are people, some of them have received very meager salaries they've been able to save and then support government with this facility so that government use it to run the state on our behalf and the little that we are due should be given to us and they are being denied. Mm. It's very, very unfortunate. If you look at other jurisdictions, uh, when you hit that age bracket, you are giving support through the welfare system and that the state virtually takes care of all your livelihoods all your expenses and the rest of them. Here we don't have that. So one would have thought that the little that we could do 
for these people is that the little that they've given to us, we give them what is due mm -hmm. to them and not treat them this way. Yeah. Especially yeah. without sounding discriminatory, especially for people who have undertaken military service. Yes. You know, in the security services, as we understand, they simply give their lives, so to speak. And look at what he tells us, he's gone where, gone wherever, just serving this country. And at this stage, it's not that he's asking government to feed him. No. He rather, like you said, yeah. has been assisting the government yeah, to run the country yeah. with his meager, you know, pension money. Yeah. And yet they can't get it. The, the difficulty when you listen to some of them one on one is that they have planned their lives such that they depend on these monies. Yeah. So at the end of the month, they know I have made, made this investment. Yeah. This money will come. If it doesn't come, he's like your, 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 your usual you know, worker who at the end of the month has not been paid. And for months, they don't receive it. It's very, very unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate. And I blame the government for it. You see, we are in difficult times. I agree. I concede. But you see, governance is run on the basis of honesty, right? Let us know the situation on the ground. Have a word or two with them. Explain things to them so that you judge all. At the end of the day, a consensus will be reached and they will know where they are. But when you keep them in the dark and they need to put pressure on government, then it becomes a disincentive for people who are lazing their boots to be able to what, put their resources in government bond. Uh, we have heard from financial experts that one of the safest investments that one can make yeah. is putting your money into government bonds. Yes. So from today, are we saying that we can encourage people to invest in that area? I saw in the 90s, where 80s and 90s or late 80s, where people took their money to the bank, the government of the day through their own program, took people's money and never returned uh, the money to them. Mm. This really affected the operations of the bank for a very long time. Uh, the banks had to put in extra performance in order uh, to win the confidence of the public back. Mm. Is that a situation that we are creating for this country, which is already cash trapped mm. and we are struggling to make economic ends meet? Uh, I think uh, this government must look at things and look at things carefully. Mm. It, it doesn't bode well for a country which prides itself that it is uh, very much in tune with rule of law. Mm. It cares for the people and that is in to serve the people through and through. Mm. Uh, once you do that, you leave uh, pain in the hearts of people and it can have serious consequences. The economic consequence is what I've enumerated right. but you have social consequences the That's social right. consequences is that you are going to create all manner of health problems for yourself the health bill these people are already having health challenges That's and right. they are dealing with them on their own way if they are not able to pay it means that the state will have to come in and support them do we have what it takes to do that the retired police officer says he's coming all the way from somewhere in the Volta region his transportation will not be reimbursed. The money that he spent coming down to Accra for this picketing will not be reimbursed. Meanwhile, in their economy, the money he has spent is a lot of money. It's a lot of money, even if it is 100 or 200 Ghana cities. It's a lot of money in their, in their economy. Uh, Samuel Okujetua Blackwa, the MP for North Tong, is... Um, asking government if it is possible uh, they should delay paying salaries to you know uh, political appointees and people in government and use it to take care of these people uh, let's see if that also is uh, feasible and works <clears throat> um, when I saw the little kids um, I was very very disturbed but suddenly something dawned on me that they are supporting their grandma. How many of you have thought about it to go and support your parents? We've left them to be on their own. Is that what society should be? Too much is normalized in this country and you are surprised. Some 10 kids have just drowned and we treat it as normal. 
Look at what happened in Ashaman. We treat it as normal. We are moving on with life. Shouldn't we? One person dies in the U.S. It's totally a wrong way. And we, we organize funerals in Ghana. We'll take a break. When we return, uh, we have Professor Kweku Asari, Stephen Kweku Asari, joining us uh, to begin uh, a special uh, discussion on removing the impediments for dual citizens, uh, Ghanaians who have taken on the citizenship of another country. The constitution through the amendment that happened in, on the 16th of December 1996 says that a citizen of Ghana may hold the citizenship of any other country in addition to his citizenship of Ghana. Without prejudice to whatever, then he says, those people cannot be holders of any office specified in this clause. That is, you can't be an ambassador, you can't be a high commissioner, you can't be secretary to the cabinet, you can't be chief of defense staff or any service chief, you can't be inspector general of police, you cannot be commissioner of customs, you cannot be director of immigrations, you cannot also be um, an MP and all sorts of things. In fact, the list has been increased and continues to be increased. The recent one was with the Special Prosecutors Act. You cannot be a special prosecutor or the deputy if you are a dual citizen. You hold Ghanaian citizenship and has taken on the citizenship of another country in addition. In fact, you cannot sit in the Supreme Court as a judge. We'll be right back to ask what the sense is and why it is now a subject for debate. the efficient new technology they've installed. She is pleased, but now she's asking, why is that still there? Pascal explains that the wells can store many, many messages. The boss is not so pleased anymore. If you haven't upgraded your contact center yet, it's time to get business done better with MTN Business. Proudly made in Ghana, Signal Cable has served the motherland and West Africa since 2018 as a leading cable manufacturer in the sub-region, providing homes and commercial spaces with top-of-the-range and global standard cables for all your electrification purposes at very convenient prices. With strong confidence in our effectively standardized cables, we bridge the gap between quality and safety, giving you the desired peace of mind to enjoy your homes and be productive in your commercial spaces with zero fear for fire outbreaks due to installation of inferior cables. Our trained team provides you with excellent customer service and give you expert advice that guarantees value for money. No matter the quantity, we provide you with free delivery within Accra and Tema. You can never get it wrong with Signal Cables. Contact us for more inquiries and free delivery on 0246-304-309. Signal Cable, 10 Nations Cable. A and you know, pavement blocks, blocks and cassa and cassa, and I did this in game Biarano, Okosha Hera, SCP, Ebemobi. Some person will soon die, now put on concrete. And you have now put on cement, Yako Pabu, a copania, Ufre SCP, card the concrete, I'm messing the down with quality. Cement warm on the good camera amount. So what am I? A fianna, Dodova, a flower, bong, and in Patamo in Nara, your office. I was Princess Road. You live at a restaurant. You need to do For SCP was 0501-672-608. And now to free number 0800-626-262.
My name is C. I'm a person living with HIV. I got to know of my HIV status when I became pregnant. Since then, I have successfully been delivered of an HIV negative baby. Thanks to PMT City Services. I follow the guidelines and take my HIV medicine called ARVs every day to date. This makes me strong, helps me, and prevents me from passing HIV onto my baby. Please avail yourself for PMT City services when pregnant. It is the only way to ensure that you do not transmit HIV onto your baby during pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. Even if you have tested for HIV recently and was negative, test again when pregnant. If you test positive, take the baby back to the hospital immediately after birth, as directed by your healthcare provider. The baby will also be given medicine immediately after birth and tested to ensure that both mother and baby are well. Let's work together to have a generation free of HIV. Our children must be free to shine. Hey, welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. The issue of dual citizenship and abolishing the prohibition on dual citizens has come to the fore this week because John Mahama said, I will amend the Constitution to allow dual citizens to be parliamentarians. Dual citizen amendments, um, we are told, will threaten the country's sovereignty. We'll try to appreciate that, understand what exactly it is meant. And we are now told, if you didn't know, that there's already a bill that is going through the motions. We'll tell you how long that bill has been there. The man who has been the brain behind the push joins us on uh, by zoom professor steven kwekuasari university of florida he is also with the cdd democracy and development fellow in public law and justice he's a member of the florida bar later we'll be joined by professor kojua pjj chia Associate Professor, School of Law, University of Ghana, Legon, and Dr. Benjamin Kumbo, Visiting Scholar, University of Ghana, School of Law, as we deal with this and the other issues. But first, let's begin a lecture, Dual Citizenship Lecture 101, with Professor Kweku Asari. Prof, thank you very much for making time to join us this morning. Uh, I know it's, uh, what time will it be where you are? Hello, Prof. Please unmute your mic. Hello, Professor Sari. 
Uh, good morning, Samson. Sorry about the glitch. Uh, I think I'm unmuted now. That's all right. So what, what time is it where you are? Uh, good question. I think it's about 4 o'clock, <laughs> maybe 5. <laughs> uh, we put you through this all the time. Thank you very much for your commitment to this country. Thanks for having me. I enjoy being with you on the program, mm. and I enjoy exchanging ideas. Right. So now tell us, what is the wisdom that went into the prohibition of dual citizens holding setting offices in this country? And what is the new uh, wisdom that is now leading to the possible removal of all those, uh, you know, prohibitions? You mentioned that there's a bill in Parliament already. Uh, the bill has gone through gazetting. It's been published twice in the Gazette as required by the Constitution. It's been introduced into Parliament and consistent with the Constitution. It's been referred to the Council of State. The Council of State has given its advice. And so the next stage is the second reading uh, followed by the third reading. At each reading, there's a vote, and for the bills to pass, or for the repeal of the articles that we want to repeal to pass, we need about 183 votes. Uh, I believe that is a significant piece of legislation that is in Parliament, uh, for a variety of reasons, because of the substantive things that it uh, seeks to do, but also because of the process. It's my knowledge the first time that a private member's bill is being used to amend the constitution and uh, the bipartisanship surrounding the process has been beautiful. Uh, the speaker is to be commended for his leadership. Uh, the majority and minority sides are to be commended for their a bipartisan approach to this. The Council of State has evaluated the bill and, it, and it's in its wisdom has given the advice. Uh, I heard uh, President Mahama giving his support for the bill. And of course, in July 2019, the current president also indicated that he supports such a bill, Samson. Now, when you spoke, you talked about Article 82, but you didn't mention Article 94.2a, which is actually the bigger problem. And I have, I don't know whether you are seeing my screen. Something. Yes, we can see, we can see. So uh, go, go ahead. Uh, there, are, there are currently four laws enabled by three distinct sources of power that provide two distinct bases of public office holding exclusions. And it's important that we separate them. Um, Uh, we have the constitutional burdens, which is Article 94.2a, and that is, as I say, pursuant to constituent power, and that is not about dual citizenship, that is allegiance-based. And then we have Article 82, which is pursuant to constituted power, and that is dual citizenship-based. The important point there is it is due to uh, constituted power. That basically means it is an amendment. It is an amendment of the original constitution compared to constituent power, which means Article 94.2a was always in the constitution, and Article 82 is what I call the first amendment. In Ghana, our first amendment is Article 8 that deals with dual citizenship because prior to the amendment, dual citizenship was not even allowed. And so Article 8 to re review the arguments for outlawing dual citizenship and said, no, look, these arguments do not hold water. Let us amend the constitution and let us allow dual citizenship. And then we have the statutory burdens, which is section 162 of the Citizenship Act, and then section 13.1a of the uh, Office of Special Prosecutor Act. Uh, section 162 is dual citizenship based, and Section 31A is allegiance based. Now, what 
is the effect of each of these laws. One, well, Article 94.2a, it is very deceptive when you read Article 94.2a because it talks about a person who owes allegiance to a country other than Ghana is not qualified to be an MP. That is a very important provision because qualification to be an MP is central to representative government and is central to citizenship. A person who is not qualified to be an MP is also not qualified to be many things. One of them would be the Speaker of Parliament, and then that person is also not qualified to be on the executive. So for instance, they cannot be president and vice president. They cannot be ministers of state, deputy ministers, and cabinet. They cannot be members of the constitutional bodies, including the Electoral Commission, the Public Service Commission, the NCCE, the Lands Commission, uh, and then the Regional Lands Commission. So uh, it's very important. And then lastly, if you are disqualified from being an MP, then technically you cannot be a founding member of a political party, you cannot be an executive member of a political party, and you cannot be a leader of a political party. So if we enforce Article 94-2A the way we enforce it when people are seeking to enter parliament, which I argue is a wrong thing, then even if you take the diaspora branches of the various political parties, dual citizens are not supposed to be executive members under Article 55 mm. Then there is Article 82. Article 82 is straightforward. It is about dual citizens. It says that a person who is a dual citizen cannot be the following offices that are enumerated here and which you read out as well. No need to belabor the point. Then we have Section 162. Remember, if you go back to Article 82, when the Constitution was amended, this is the uh, First Amendment. Under the First Amendment, the, there's a stipulation that Parliament can add any office to the list of positions that dual citizens cannot hold. That's and right. pursuant to that power, Parliament passed Section 162 of the Citizenship Act and added the following uh, offices, which you have read and which I'm not going to go over again. And finally, the Office of Special Prosecutor at Parliament also added that a person who owes allegiance to a country other than Ghana uh, cannot be a special prosecutor. So we need to make sure that we understand that we are talking about either dual citizenship or owe allegiance. And in my opinion, the two things cannot mean the same thing because in law, as you know, there's what we call the principle of meaningful variation or the principle of consistent usage. All right. And that basically means if you say dual citizen, it means dual citizen, but then if you use another term, that term cannot also then be uh, construed as meaning a uh, dual citizen. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at the reasons that people normally give for why dual citizens should not hold office. Uh, first, they say that they have divided loyalties Second, they say that uh, they will be confused or conflicted when it comes to war or diplomacy or extinguishing fire and so on and so forth. See, for instance, a ca the case that I sent to court in 2012, they say they can chop money and run away to their other uh, country. They say they want to eat their cake and have it. They say they will compete unfairly against politicians. They say they will take jobs away from mono citizens. They say they are not full Ghanaians. And they say you cannot serve two masters. Something, mm. if you look at the list, you will see that this is an old and discredited argument because the same arguments that I recited were the arguments that were used in the first phase to outlaw dual citizenship. Mm. in the 1992 constitution. However, parliament revisited this problem and said, look, these reasons do not hold water, and therefore let us amend the constitution and allow people to hold other citizenship. So basically these are arguments 
that have been rehashed and that were sometimes previously rejected. Second, experience has disconfirmed the fears. Why do I say that? Well, because since 1996, when we passed the first amendment, we've been waiting for these things that dual citizens are supposed to do, and nothing has happened. We haven't seen any dual citizen betray the country. We haven't seen any dual citizen eat his cake and have it. We haven't seen any dual citizen, uh, citizen serving two masters and so on and so forth. So we've had a natural experiment and we have longitudinal data from 1996 to now to show that these fears are not just hypothetical, but they indeed have not materialized. Third, there is this question of divided loyalties. Something, when you look at the list that we looked at and the positions that dual citizens have been excluded from, it's hard to understand how divided loyalties apply to many of the positions. For instance, are we arguing that the special prosecutor will not be able to go after corrupt people because of their shared citizenship of a foreign country? The reality, Samson, is that most professionals have different loyalties, including to tribe, including to religion, and so on and so forth, but can discharge their professional obligation without allowing, allowing these allegiances to get in their way. In fact, this is the argument that people use when um, somebody with political affiliation is appointed to go and serve on the electoral commission. They argue that, well, merely because the person has a political affiliation and merely because the person votes doesn't mean he cannot be a professional and he cannot discharge his duties with professionalism. With respect, the same arguments hold here. And then the, uh, the, the most, the import, another important point is that there is actually data on this. Somebody actually studied this with uh, Swiss nationals and found out that all the fears about divided loyalties uh, really hold no water whatsoever. Then they talk about the person can misappropriate funds and run away. Well, uh, this argument on the state, the country's ability to use the mutual legal assistance framework to go after criminals. Let's note that foreigners in Ghana are not even free to come here to commit crimes and run for shelter in their country because we can go after them and therefore we can go after someone who is a Ghanaian and who absconds with our money. We can, there are ways to go after that. In any event, if that were the case, the obvious solution is not an extreme ban on everyone, which becomes overbroad, but rather we need to emplace misappropriation controls so that people are not actually misappropriating funds. Then there is the cake argument. That one is one that I don't understand because it almost assumes that people go to public office to eat some cake, and therefore they don't want other people to come and eat that cake and then somehow have it. I don't understand that argument. What we are talking about is public service, not eating cake. And so this argument, I don't find uh, credible. Then there's the fair competition argument. The fair competition argument also lacks merit because it is the appointer, the person who is making the appointment, it is the voter who would have the decision right to hire citizens for public office a dual citizen cannot force himself on anyone. And then some people say, well, dual citizens, they are fractional citizens. They are half-baked Ghanaians. There's no such thing as a fractional citizen. If you are Ghanaian, you are Ghanaian. It doesn't matter that you are a citizen of another country. You are 100% Ghanaian, and you are 100% a citizen of that other country. Uh, remember that Ghanaian citizens have the same duties under the Constitution. The Constitution does not say that if you are mono Ghanaian, you have more responsibilities or higher duties than someone who is a dual citizen. So we must treat all our citizens equally. And then there's this notion of serving two masters. And again, that is a problematic view of the problem because citizenship should not be viewed as a master-servant relationship. 
It's more about a reciprocal rights and duties to the state. These Ghanaians, when appointed or elected, will not be serving two masters because they must relocate and reside in Ghana before their nomination or appointment, and they will be serving only in Ghana. They will be serving only in Ghana, and they will be serving as professionals with professional obligations. They will take oath, they will take oath of office, and they will be bound by their oath of office. Now, uh, another variant of the serving the two masters argument is posited in 1815, 1815 by the US Secretary of State, George Bancroft. He noted that nations should as soon tolerate a man with two wives as a man with two countries, as soon bear with polygamy as that state of double allegiance. Well, this view of polygamy and double allegiance is not one that is accepted by all cultures. In fact, in our culture, polygamy is allowed uh, by some sectors. And my better analogy is that once allegiance to a wife does not diminish their allegiance to their mother. <laughs> now, uh, in any event, you can see that all these uh, reasons and arguments that I'm putting forward are entirely speculative and are not based on any empirical reality. Similar hypothetical and speculative concerns may be raised to disqualify just about everyone from holding any position. So for instance, you can easily say, well, if a person is poor, he should not be given public office because his poverty might compel him to steal. But disqualification should be based on real actions, such as conviction for crime, rather than mere suspicion that one may act in some unspecified, undesirable way, merely because of their status, proclaim that, and then enact that into law by penalizing them even before they've done the thing that you said they could do. Now, so we have debunked all the arguments that they put forth about why dual citizens should not hold office. Now, let me give you my reasons why I think dual citizens should be allowed to hold public office. My first ground is economics. Ghana is a net exporter of skilled labor. And we have to be aware of that. And we have to have return friendly policies that attract these skilled labor and their wealth back to the country. A repeal of the law that is allowing people who are dual citizens to hold public office would encourage and stabilize both remittances and return migration. Furthermore, it will facilitate the use of vehicles such as the diaspora bond, which countries like Nigeria and Israel have put to good effect. But the reason they put to good effect is they've not uh, categorized their dual citizens as disloyal. They have embraced them. And by embracing them, it's much easier to then go to them and say, well, come and invest in the country, buy diaspora bond, and so on and so forth. Second, I have Republican grounds as a justification for the repeal. Under that, I know that the right to fully participate in the public space is the asset test of citizenship. If you can't do certain things, then you shouldn't be called a citizen. So for instance, what is the difference between a citizen and an alien? Mm. Well, a citizen can vote an alien cannot vote. A citizen can sit in parliament, an alien cannot sit in parliament. A citizen can be part of the executive, an alien cannot be. If you have a citizen and the citizen cannot do all those things that we enumerated, then what you have created is not really a citizen, you've created a fractional citizen. It's not dual citizen, mm. it's a fractional citizen. Second, it aligns with our constitutional duties. I've already explained that because that duty is imposed on all citizens, not some citizens. Third, it avoids a situation where we have classes of citizens, some with supra rights and others with sub rights. We need all our citizens to have equal rights, have one vote uh, be, uh, allowed to be voted for, and so on. Third, 
There's the public interest argument, and uh, uh, ex-president Mahama mentioned this in his interview the other time. Uh, we have our brain trust all over the world, and we should be able to tap into that brain trust, similar to the way we select our black stars. We don't ask whether you are a dual citizen or not. We ask, are you a Ghanaian? And if you are a Ghanaian and you are very good at playing soccer, we put you in the black stars, Kevin uh, Boateng, he goes and he performs, and we are all happy. We are not worried that if there's a penalty and Kevin Boateng has to play it against Germany, somehow because he's also a German, he's going to uh, somehow uh, kick the ball to throw. No. <laughs> when you wear the jersey, you are a professional. You are a professional and you will do your job uh, accordingly. I also know that most of the excluded positions are, are technocratic and should be based on skills, knowledge, education, experience, and training, or what I call speech over here. We need meritocracy, not some ambiguous loyalty that nobody can define and nobody can tell you what it is. And I've already noted that professionalism trumps primitive allegiance. So I'm an attorney. Uh, if a client who is not a Ghanaian hires me to go and sue the government of Ghana, I'm not going to say, say well, I'm a Ghanaian, and therefore I'm not going to uh, 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 do my professional work. No, no professional thing that way. You are hired to do a job and you are able to set aside your allegiance, your allegiance to your family, your allegiance to your tribe, your allegiance to your religion, your allegiance to your country, and do a professional job. That is why, Samson, Ghanaians, Supreme Court justice and other justices are able to go to other countries to sit on their Supreme Court and sometimes to even serve as the chief justice of those countries. So both in Gambia and in Kenya, we've had Ghanaian justices who actually went to their courts and presided at chief justice. Presently. They were not worried because this is a technocratic position Prof, and they have confidence. Prof, it's, not, it's, not, it's not only a matter of the past. As we speak, there are Ghanaian judges who are both judges in the court in Ghana and in the Gambia. Precisely. And yet, in our own country, a Ghanaian who just happened to also have the citizenship of another country cannot sit on our Supreme Court. And this actually discourages people, some of the people who have dual citizenship, some of the judges who have dual citizenship, they don't aspire to go to the Supreme Court because they don't want to trade their other citizenship to sit on the Supreme Court. So we are hurting ourselves. Sometimes the president wants to appoint somebody, but he can't appoint that person because of that law. Uh, now, I've also mentioned or I don't, uh, that professionalism trumps primitive allegiance. And then the last point under the public interest is that the repeal of the law will arrest a potentially explosive exclusionary tool. And what do I mean by that? Look, if we look to our neighbors to the, uh, to, to the West, that is Cote d'Ivoire. They had a civil war. The first civil war was triggered because of this citizenship issue. Alassane Ouattara was being disqualified from holding the office of president because allegedly his father came from Burkina Bay. Mm. And that was enough <laughs> to cause that first civil war. There are examples of that all over Africa. Uh, and I cite an example of somebody like Kenneth Kaunda, who basically was the founder of Zambia. But in 1996, they wanted to disqualify him from public office because allegedly his mom was from Malawi. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Why can't we take advantage of all our skills and put it to our use? Third, at the fourth, I think we need to move beyond rhetorics in this area. Repealing the law aligns our public office holding policies with our rhetoric on the diaspora. You know, we, we always have the Joseph project, the year of the return, and so on. And when we do this, we even give some foreigners citizenship. Now, what are we telling the foreigners? That we are giving you citizenship and thereby making you a dual citizen and in so doing, we are making you disloyal to Ghana and your other countries. Why would we 
on one hand, say that dual citizens are disloyal and yet happily confer citizenship on foreigners right. so that they become dual citizens and we exclude them from our political space. But if there are other countries who are thinking like us, then they would also be excluded from their mm -hmm. uh, uh, political space. Fortunately, most countries do not think that way. I also mentioned that the repeal will fulfill our obligations under the Africa Charter and will realize the constitutional promise of equal citizenship. And then finally, I mentioned that it restores the presumption of loyalty and innocence by refraining from penalizing based on suspicions and speculations. Uh, it also puts us on in, in tandem with the rest of the world. Uh, Sierra Leone, UK, Nigeria, Canada, USA, Senegal. These are examples of countries that allow their dual citizens to hold any office. Mm. In fact, something, if you look at a country like UK, you don't even have to be a citizen of UK to uh, sit in parliament. If you are a resident and you are a citizen of a Commonwealth country like Ghana, you can sit in their parliament. That is progressive. That is progressive. And uh, I would argue later that Article 94.2a is a language, is language that the British exported to all their colonies. So if you do a comparative review of constitutions, every Commonwealth country has this allegiance clause. All right. Ghana is the only country that interfaces as a dual citizenship. Okay. And then uh, we uh, talked about the exclusions detracting from our liberal uh, credentials. But let me make two quick points. First, this law, when it's repealed, does not entitle anybody to a job. It just restores their right to uh, participate fully in the public space. Voters still will control who should represent them, and then the appointees still will decide who should uh, uh, be appointed. Uh, when to exclude? Are there any circumstances under which somebody should be excluded from holding public office? I believe so. I believe so. But I would say this should be limited to situations where they are compelling specific articulable interests, not speculative interests. All right. And in any event, these restrictions must be narrowly tailored. And I would also argue that we should apply a conflict of interest framework where there is risk. That means you disclose or you exclude yourself from certain decisions if there is the potential that your other citizenship will be in conflict with your job that you are doing. But a blanket ban is too broad in my mind. Uh, let me uh, uh, cite two Ghanaians and then I'll start up. Uh, first is Obeda Samoa in 1968 when the same issue was being discussed. Guess what he said? I've heard the argument that if somebody who is what they refer to as half Ghanaian becomes president, he may owe allegiance to another country. Well, that may be so, but this is a matter which should be known to the Ghanaian electorate. And if the Ghanaian electorate choose to elect such a person, that's their business. I think this is an issue which should be left to the Ghanaian electorate and that all Ghanaian citizens should be given equal rights. Over that Samoa 1968, I totally agree with that. And last, Kupur, Kupur basically says, now there are a lot of intermarriages among the races. And if a person comes to Ghana and marries a Ghanaian woman, if their children were made to suffer because of this intermarriage, then I do not see any justice in this. Therefore, if you are going to discourage people because of birth and preclude them from occupying high positions in our society, it will not be in conformity with civilization and natural justice. Thank you, um, Thank you very much. Excellent. And that is detailed and brilliant. Now, Professor Kweku uh, Sari, uh, making that presentation to us in the last 30 minutes, uh, he's going to s uh, stay on. We'll hear from... Um, our guests in studio and two others, uh, two other professors, and then return to Prof on that critical question that moves President Mahama to suggest or to make a promise that the prohibitions will be removed. Remember the Jachikwising situation? We'll be asking Prof, how is one a dual citizen 
a citizen of Ghana and another country, and yet can be said not to owe allegiance to a country other than Ghana, which is the, the, the issue. And he says that he is prepared to accept a certain exclusion, very limited. What are the circumstances under which he will accept that kind of um, exclusion? We'll take a quick break, return. Dr. Asasari is right here in the studio. Professor Pierre J and Dr. Benjamin Kumbo will also join us later. We'll be right back. The window small. Ah, your room be too bright, oh. Why you be vampire when you know the likes sunlight? Oh my guy, my eyes, oh my eyes. Behind the PC problem, oh. in the sun problem. Come on, light bulbs, sir. This no matter. Eh? I bear go Robert and Sons. Mm. Oh yeah. Then my chick to him, I know correct. Cra. Where Robert and Sons sort them out sharp. Now so so stylish frames in the wrong. <laughs> we go go Robert and Sons right here. No, I was sitting inside from. For over 25 years, Robert & Sons continues to provide specialist eye care for both adults and children. Locate us at Adabaka, Adenta, Kumasi, Usudangwa, Tema, Weja, and East Legon. Call 050-151-9111. Robert & Sons, seeing is believing. job is done. Turn your home and business into an internet highway and experience the revolution of working and playing without limits. Visit broadband.mtn.com.gh to sign up for MTN Fiber for Home and Business today. CEOs, are you ready? The 7th Ghana CEO Summit and Expo is here. The foremost business conference for over 500 topmost CEOs, heads of state, business leaders and ambassadors to be held on the 22nd of May 2023 at the Kempinski Hotel on the theme Economic Sovereignty, Sustainability and Digital Industrial Transformation. New path for growth and prosperity. This impactful summit has attracted over 2,000 high-level dignitaries including His Excellencies, President Nana Adedankwe Kufuado, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Dubaomia and ex President John Mahama. Be enlightened with actionable perspectives, CEO performance strategies, strategic insights on the latest business trends through CEO masterclasses, plenaries, keynote, expert insights, and CEO peer networking sessions. Register to participate at GhanaCEOSummit.com. For inquiries, call 0546 391970 or 0244 687222. The Ghana CEO Summit and Expo is powered by Ghana CEO Network in partnership with Deloitte, Ministry of Public Enterprise. Prices, GIPC, SIGA, and the Multimedia Group. TCC Supply. There are days when you think, whoa, today I've earned it. So order a global. Days when plans run longer. What if we order a global? Or days when you can't control everything? Oh yes, because on Global, you can order anything you want. Global, you order, we deliver. Hi, good day. Your friend is Dr. Victor Nana Dankwa, because every big dan healthcare. A primary bed and call for a hospital like a catch-up with your liver and kidney-related conditions. Obi-Ohon Mwaya, so fatty liver. 
Obi o hoye catch so nya hydronephrosis. Obi o hoye catch so nya pyonephritis which is inflammation of the kidney. Obi o hoye catch so nya kidney ni so so bia bench na ho. Obi o hoye so nya creatinine and as any GFR and until we so ho ho na sit me ta ta. Afi o do se mia na atom. Don so na obetu so no me ho se fun bi aba bi tieni. Ka wa ko ato ye. And until na vegan healthcare ya ba se ye na alternative way so e be sawo ya re. Se o fa vegan ka it was serene environment with ultra modern facilities. As I was share your there was Pinterest, Coca Cola runabout, close to Fidelity Bank, Stan Chat in Toronto. North elected a person to represent them in Parliament. This government has manipulated the judiciary in such a way that they've injuncted the member of Parliament for Asin North. So even though he's the elected member, he cannot perform the duties of an MP. That is a gross injustice and it's an affront to our democracy. But I want to assure the people of Ghana and I want to assure the people like Jechi Kwesin, that is our member of parliament for Sino, that when NDC comes into power, we are going to clarify that constitutional provision that compels them to give up their foreign citizenship before they contest elections. A country's human resource is its best resource. And we happen to have about 3 million of our citizens abroad. They've acquired experience. They've acquired different talents. And why would we have a law that says that if you want to come and be an MP in Ghana, you must give up your other citizenship? Meanwhile, we have a dual citizenship law. We're going to clarify it. They can come and stand for parliament. They can come and hold office in Ghana. They don't have to give up their other citizenship to be able to hold that, those offices. Right, so let's get to hear from Dr. Sasanti and uh, Professor uh, Kujia PJ Etia what they have to say about this new wave and move. Remember, it's a private member's bill that uh, is being talked about as the one in parliament. Uh, from what I know about it, it's taken quite a long time. And it didn't really occur to me as if there was a commitment to pass it, even though the talk that you are hearing after President Mahama said he will do it, suggests that there is a commitment. Well, let's see a bit more of it. Now, look, what's your view on this issue? Um, they say um, lawyers, when we go to court, we must not necessarily, you know, have sympathies with the matter that we represent. We just do our professional work. But I went to court to represent Ghanaians abroad on the RUPA, yeah. the Representation of the People Amendment Act, 2006. We passed the law in 2006 and said, we allow Ghanaians who are abroad the same right as any other Ghanaian to vote in our elections. But we never implemented it. So these Ghanaians went to court in 2017 and the court upheld their rights that beyond just making putting it in our law it was their right and gave the electoral commission one year we didn't wait to take a constitutional instrument to parliament to prescribe how it should be done in the process in doing that case i discovered that there have been at that time there have been two different occasions years when Ghanaians living abroad, they are contributing remittances to Ghana. And that, those are remittances that, that have been tracked, not the ones that they give to a friend to come and no. give to somebody. Those that have been tracked two times, and even almost a third time, they had contributed more than we generated locally, revenue. Those abroad mm -hmm. generated more than we generate home. At the point, they were giving us more than we get from our cocoa. 
And I pause and ask myself, what's going on? I don't know where you stand. Right. Uh, Samson, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Interesting in the sense that there are a number of perspectives that if they explain very well, uh, to liven up the conversation and then get people understand it the way it ought to be. Uh, dual citizenship is not a bad idea. It is not. Uh, because if you look at the, the main, the trust of the argument in there, it brings in a whole lot that today's world you can do without. Right. But people like us, my view is that uh, there are certain critical positions that I believe somebody with a dual citizenship should not, uh, you know, occupy. And um, I'll go ahead to uh, explain them. But I'll begin my submission by asking questions. That those who believe that dual citizenship is a good idea and that it should be made possible for everybody uh, who, has that, uh, who is in that bracket to assume any position within the political space, I want them to also help me to understand this. Why can't also they uh, extend the conversation to include the presidency? That, yes, if you believe that a dual citizen can be an IGP, can be the CDS, can be director of immigration, why not the president? That question should occupy the attention. Another one is that why can't we have people with dual citizenship being full-blown military officers or police officers? Why? That conversation must also agitate their minds. Um, I'm saying this because there are good reasons why, in all this, we have excluded the presidency. Critical because there are certain things that we hold dear to our hearts when we are dealing with government and we want to what, deal with what the state. If you look at other jurisdictions which people cite that, oh, it's happening here. It is a good thing here. In other jurisdictions, it exists. One of the reasons why those things exist there is that institutions exist. And I'm talking about strong institutions that work. So monitoring and maintenance of the institution is what? Top notch. So if, for instance, you are um, a minister, you have a dual citizenship, and you are supposed not to do A, B, C, there is a whole system that will monitor you so that you don't cross the line. Is it the case in Ghana that we have the institutions which are strong enough to be able to what, help us to arrive at where we're supposed to have? Uh, if you also uh, look at some of the, the, the positions, especially the key positions such as the IDP, uh, the CDS, and the rest of them, uh, even if you serve that office, honestly, leave the office, and you want to take up certain responsibilities, you are required by writing to furnish the government of the day about your activities, and then they go through and give you the green light. That condition is there. Why is it there? It tells us that there's more to it, not necessarily the economic argument and the rest of them. But let's come back to governance. Uh, governance uh, simply put, it's uh, how we made use of economic and political resources to make life better for human beings, all right? And you cannot do this without holding certain things dear to your heart. And that is why in governance, secrecy is critical. And you being a lawyer, you are very familiar with the secrecy laws mm. that exist. Why are they there? It's to protect a certain interest. So in governance, secrecy is important. Uh, interest, the state interest is important. That is why when, in order to prevent these things from abuse, there are laws that are, you know, drafted uh, to safeguard interest there. You see what the, the, the um, conflict of interest, what, law, making sure that we are human beings. We will be confronted with situations where we benefit from both ends. And then when it happens that way, it puts you into a conflict of interest situation when you are supposed to what, uh, be a dual citizen in this regard. Mm. At that point, uh, where would your allegiance or loyalty be? Obviously, where you benefit more will likely to hold the sway. So there is a law that regulates you. 
right? If you look at this, and then you also tie in to the issue of what allegiance. Allegiance is so critical in governance because it, it, it is nothing but what? A civil service tradition that ensures that there is what? Loyalty and honesty in the discharge of public work duty, right? So all these things are put into the system to make sure that things work and they work the way they ought to be. Uh, let us uh, look at uh, this situation that you have a CDS, you have IGP, uh, and the rest of the security uh, couples who have dual citizenship, and they are working with the president who is not a dual citizen. What is the situation here? We are made to believe that it's in court. The president is working with foreigners. There are sensitive information within the security what, uh, framework that should not go out to anywhere. But For example, the, information about what? Information about the, 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 the security of the state. Uh, there are certain specific information like um, uh, it hasn't come mm. to mind readily, but there are no more of them. Yeah, because the, the thing is, any time the issue comes up, yeah. this is the argument that is used about sensitive information, particularly regarding security. Yeah. The way I like to help us to demystify is yeah. to ask the question I just asked. Yes. I asked for example, and people will talk about our armory uh, and what have you. And I asked the question, even today, yeah. our army is being trained by foreigners yeah. to combat terrorism. Yes. Most of what we have in our armory mm -hmm. is either given to us for free or we take it from people and they know what they have given us. So what's the fear? Yeah. Let me give you a supply with, with example of that information. Information about declaration of war. If there's a, a, you know, a situation where Ghana has to declare war against another country and you have CDS who have planned this with the president, would you want this information to be in the hands of somebody who would do our citizenship with that of the country that you are going to declare war with? We are human beings. Let us not pretend. It is natural that where I feel so strongly that I have some benefit, I will be able to what, uh, you know. Is there not the potential for a mono citizen, someone who doesn't have allegiance to another country? Sorry, sorry. Um, I said allegiance. Um, because I have come to understand the differences between who a dual citizen is and the question of allegiance. The two don't appear to be the yes. same. Now, is, is it not, are the temptations not the same for somebody who is a mono citizen to betray their country? Yes, but there we are saying that all these things, the potential for these things to blow up in our face is very much dependent on the institutions that we have and the kind of what orientation, socialization we have walked people through, all right? Is it the case in Ghana? We are not talking about any other country, mm. but Ghana. Is it the case that our people have the, the socialization, the right attitude to be able to decide this thing perfectly the way we ought to be? We have seen instances here where security plan people, uh, security people plan soup, and only to go there and realize that there are security men <laughs> right. who are dealing with the criminals. No dual there. citizens are involved. All right. <laughs> yes. So we are saying that institutions are critical. The states that we are talking, mm. that they are going full hog and implementing them, they have institutions that set, uh, you know, the tone for these things to exist. Not only that, they have the right attitude through orientation, socialization, and all that. We are saying that, yes, that is why my in intro was that it's not a bad idea, but let us watch. Which way do you prefer? Yeah. An obviously corrupt security person or a dual citizen or one who has allegiance to another country and is, has integrity? You see, all these things were things that if you look at the, the report on the Committee of Experts, all right, this is one of the things... That's for the Constitution. Yeah, for the Constitution. One of the things that bordered or occupied your attention. They were very much alive. And look, sorry, but the copy of the Constitution you are holding, yeah. I can say without a doubt, 
that this is one of the first copies <laughs> of the Constitution when it was published. Yes, yes. <laughs> you should see the, yes. the color yes. and the cover. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. right. It, they, they were alive with some of these challenges. And so if you look at their debate, they look at it and then they were able to grant that dual citizenship in this Constitution with the argument that there are economic benefits there are economic refugees and the rest of them, which you have alluded to about the fact that, uh, you know, transfer of war rate, money into the country help to build. But the question us, if you read, I want to read with your permission that we do not want an occasion where allegiance to Ghana is shared with allegiance to some other country. This, they were so emphatic that they believe that there is something in here that we need to examine and be critical about. And that is where I take my strength from. So I believe that, yes... Has a lot not changed since 92? A lot has changed. But has, have you also, can you say, without fear of contradiction, mm. that you have institutions that have the capacity, the wherewithal, to support this word, venture? Not long ago, our Supreme Court said that if the president traveled, yeah. it meant his office is vacant. Yes. Should you be saying that when the president travels, he's the president? Yeah. Where he is, what he's doing, he's doing it as a president. And in today's technological world, he just by the top of the button. That is. And he's, 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 he, there's, there's no even sign that he has traveled. It brings you to institutions and technology and the rest of them. The U.S. president travels. And within the, the Air Force One, he's able to do a whole lot around the world. But let us also look at this sensitive position I'm talking about and have a feel of what I have under my sleeves. If you take, for instance, an ambassador who is a dual citizen mm. and he's supposed to preside over, you know, information about state-to-state -state relationship regarding his country and other countries, what is the point of having a diplomatic bag? What is the point? All right. Foreign policies are developed based on some of these high level of what confidence that you take information from uh, where you reside and then you pass it on through a diplomatic bag is it is it resolved country. is it resolved if the person is a canadian is ghanaian and acquires a canadian citizenship and you don't take them to canada you take them elsewhere it doesn't matter what so he doesn't become ambassador to canada but uh, to nigeria Yes. High Commission. Yes, I am saying, my position is that I'm not against dual citizenship per se, mm. but I'm saying that uh, this path we are charting, mm. we should be what? You know, careful about it. Careful about it. And let me, let me bring in Prof. Sapir yeah. uh, J. Uh, Prof., thank you very much for your patience. Um, listening to Prof. Kukwa uh, Sari for 30 minutes and still hanging on there to join the discussion. Um, I don't know where you, you stand with this. And we will come to the question about the differences between allegiance and the dual citizenship. Now, it does appear that the two major political parties are now fighting for praise um, for who it is that will remove the prohibitions against uh, Ghanaians who have other citizenship and want to participate fully at certain levels of our political and uh, economic life of the state. P please, please unmute your mic. I have. Can Good. you hear me? Okay. It, it, it's been a, an interesting discussion and um, I think it's, it's a topic that this time is due for us to bring a conclusion to. And it's interesting you make the point that now both parties are trying to claim the glory for fighting to remove those barriers uh, which have been placed in the way of dual citizens in assuming um, certain positions in the country. So it tells you how much the issue has been politicized. When uh, um, one party is in power, it tries to use um, the Article 94 to a provision to clamp down or to put impediments in the way of the other party. 
And when the other party is also in power, it tries to use it in a different way. Uh, but it's interesting that now they seem to come to the point that we all have to, um, you know, let this impediment be removed. Um, of course, the question of citizenship is a political question. If you go back into history, um, if you look at the question of nationality, even some are claiming that today, because the, the whole idea of citizenship has moved from the municipal plane to become an international law issue, a human rights issue, we should not even talk about nationality, but we should talk about citizenship. Because the idea of a national and an alien, which used to be the, the, the means of dividing or the differentiating somebody who is not a member of a country from another person, was used sometimes in a discriminatory manner. When you go back to issues of having access to a visa, a passport, and, and all that. So um, indeed, it's a political question. But like I'm saying, it is now not merely in the realm of a country relating it to sovereignty and saying that I have the power within my territorial boundaries to determine who should be a citizen or not. But because of globalization, because of the changing nature of relations between countries and so on, and most importantly, because of the fact that it is no more states that are the predominant actors in international law. We have citizens being recognized as major actors. There is a need to um, for countries having no choice. Be, be, at probably be, be, um, around the past 20 years or so, especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall, for, for dual citizenship to be given a, a bigger stake. And we even have situations where um, some may become a citizen of another country without having stepped in that country or without having gone through certain processes and procedures, simply because it is not about allegiance or anything. It's about economic factors. If I can raise 100, uh, 10 million, even 1 million, and to invest in, in another country, I could become a citizen of that country. And if you connect that to the remittances that dual citizens bring into the country and other expertise that they have and other contributions they make into the country, to the country, then the whole issue of who should be a citizen or who can be a dual citizen um, assumes a status where it is over exaggerated and it's not giving the critical push that should ensure that mm -hmm. we benefit from the role of dual citizens in the development of the country. So that politicization should certainly end. And I'm glad that the debate has shifted to that stage. And I think that we should also look at the judiciary. They have a big role to play in this, because it is clear that, as Professor Sari has properly um, articulated, there's a difference between Article 8.2 and Article 94.2a. One is talking about citizenship. One is talking about dual um, allegiance. And citizenship and allegiance um, are related one way or the other, but they, are, they could be different things. It, it also brings to the question the whole idea of patriotism. And so we, we need to draw the lines carefully. Mm. My take is that I'm, I'm, I'm all for adopting a human rights-based approach to this question. And if we look at it from that angle, we can see that a lot of injustices, a lot of biases have been perpetrated against dual citizens. And I'm glad Professor Asari um, was able to debunk um, the, the arguments that have been put across to make a claim why dual citizens cannot hold certain positions. Mm. And so in this regard, but we need to be careful, though, because certainly there are some few positions that may justify um, limitations as to um, whether dual citizens can occupy that position. I'm not in a position to identify um, key areas now. But if you look at citizenship laws, the number of countries they are categorized. They are mm. different. But, but, but Prof, let, let's, let's face it. So, for example, our present law, uh, you can't be the fire chief. Uh, what could be the reason for that? That uh, you, oh. intentionally, <laughs> you intentionally burn the country or what? <laughs> as, for, as for those... Ex um, you, can't be, you can't be head of the <laughs> Lands Commission. Uh, Why? You sell the lands to foreigners? <laughs> no, I, I think those, those examples or the, the list that 
we find in um, Article 52 five two at, at five two seven is um, it's, it's, it's a non-starter. It, it's, it, it looks it sounds ridiculous in a lot of ways, and I think mm -hmm. that we need to properly find um, um, con do a debate a discussion and identify which areas we think, strictly speaking, should be reserved for. Mono citizens. Is it, is it, equally, is it not equally a compelling argument to suggest that if you love Ghana so much that you want to be in the Supreme Court, you want to put your services at, at the Supreme Court, um, perhaps when you are here too, you can also help one of our universities. Maybe you have uh, access to getting a lot of funding for universities, as happens outside, so that universities don't depend too much on the state and so on. Um, you simply just uh, relinquish your, your citizenship to that country and come, instead of wanting to be here and there at the same time. Is, does that question also not hold? It does. And I think that, like, like I'm saying, um, we, we are losing a lot by um, placing those barriers in the way of dual citizens, because there's a lot we can benefit from. And the, the disadvantages or, or maybe... Um, mainly security factors which are mentioned as a basis to restrain certain dual citizens from occupying certain positions are very limited. And if you look at our laws as a stand now, um, the argument has already been made that it is not targeting Ghanaians who have acquired foreign citizenship. It is rather the opposite. Foreigners who have acquired Ghanaian citizenship and who we are not sure about whether um, the, 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 the reason for acquiring a citizenship. You may do all the background checks, but there could be some other factors or some maybe criminal record or some other reason that they want to be a citizen. So mm -hmm. for such people, it's a little bit more difficult to determine the, the rationale for their becoming Ghanaian citizens. Of course, some are clear in case of marriage and so on. And so that is where you may say that maybe the person has performed some other function for his or her country before becoming a, a dual Ghanaian uh, a, a citizen. So certain positions should mm. be denied such a person. Okay. But it shouldn't be Ghanaians who have acquired foreign citizenship and, and want to occupy certain positions. Even if, with, with that argument, we need to be careful because otherwise we could end up discriminating against uh, such uh, persons. Well, of when, when Professor uh, uh, Kukwasari mentioned the the AU, or is it, uh, yes, you mentioned an AU protocol of sort. Uh, I, I said, well, thank God you are on the show. Um, for example, we, in the same manner, the Ghanaians who are abroad and they are right to vote, we pass the law, but we're not, we're not doing it. And often you hear the argument that, oh, it is too expensive to do. Um, the limited ones that we do in our missions for Ghanaians who are on mission, students who are on scholarship abroad, that one, they say, oh, it's, a, it's, it's on a low key. It's not much. So we can do that comfortably. But expanding it to Ghanaians who live abroad will be expensive. And then I pause and ask myself, Nigerians vote in their elections living right here in Ghana, and we supervise it for them. Um, what is it that they have that we don't have that we can't do it? And in this time and age, must it always be the procurement attitude that we must procure some logistics and go and put in a certain place, or it should be a, a thing about leveraging on, you know, technology? So do you think that from this kind of attitude that we have, we will ever do what we now uh, saying we are likely to do, removing the prohibitions on dual citizens? Well, I think that it's a question of political will. And if you look at the issue of whether um, Ghanaians can vote from, from, um, from outside or dual citizens can vote, it is not that expensive. We can leverage on technology to be able to do this and do it effectively. At the same time, even if it is, democracy is expensive. And because at the end of the day, the benefit that you get out of it will outweigh the, the, the cost implications involved. 
So you do it all the same for the sake of promoting peace, development, and so on. And so even if it's an expensive thing, we have to do it. But the fact that others are doing it indicates that we don't have any excuse but to do it as well. Mm. And coming down to um, whether we, we, will, we will really ensure that this debate we're having now and, and will be implemented, I think that at this stage we have no choice. Mm. And it is incumbent on both parties that they will not be playing, continue to play politics with it. Because the debate came up again as a result of uh, what President Mahama said. And it relates to the Yashi Kwesin case. Um, we don't know if when they come to power and they have the majority in parliament, if that becomes the case, they will still be interested in pursuing it. Mm. But the point has come that we need to push that this we have reached a threshold that we cannot continue to be on the other side of the fence. And we have to move to the other side and be on the same side of the majority of countries that allow for dual citizenship and allow for dual citizens to also hold certain uh, supposedly sensitive positions. Okay. Before the Jachi Kwesin case, uh, we recall that not too long ago, we, we put one of our citizens in, in prison um, because of a similar situation. Adamo Dramani Sakande. Yes. Uh, and they, they, false, they fell sick. Uh, it didn't matter that um, the, the people deemed him qualified and the best person to represent them in parliament. It didn't matter that he was serving them well and they were happy with him. What mattered to us as a country was that by the time he was um, um, registering to stand elections for them, he was holding the citizenship of the United Kingdom. Is that is it? Yeah, and that yeah. was a problem. That was all that there was about it. Um, so let's do it this way. Um, I'll take a break. When we return, we'll bring Professor Kukwasari on uh, briefly, briefly, and to now seek to distinguish the, the make the distinction between dual citizen and the allegiance. And then we'll move on to the next subject about the security services that the politicians are promising um, will give uh, us jobs for their supporters. Um, the Ayawaso West Wagon Commission uh, found that that was a problem and we needed to stop because the parties, once one, where one party wins, they push a good number of their people into the army, into the police, into immigration. And it's becoming now a partisan uh, security service. What's the danger in that? And what does the promise made by John Mahama also portend? News file is live on your Joy News channel, Joy FM, Love FM, and our affiliates, including KTU Radio in Koforidia, ATL FM in Cape Coast, and many more of our affiliates. Remember that we have you covered as far as the NDC's uh, delegate elections are concerned. Uh, elections for um, MPs, as it were, parliamentary candidates, and the flag bearer of the party are concerned. We'll bring you everything that you need to know about it and how far it is going. The best political team, Evans Mensah, uh, Winston Amwa, they are ready. We'll be right back. For decades, we have helped businesses connect with their trade partners all over the globe. From Ghana to Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo, Senegal, China, Morocco, France, Netherlands, and many other countries. We have made it possible to bring Ghana to the world. We have brought small and medium businesses closer to their customers across the regions in Ghana with our SME support facilities. We have brought relief and smiles to the faces of families with our employee personal loans. With our cutting-edge technology and digital support, 
we take the burden of complex thinking off you. Making life simple. That is who we are. As close as a partner. Bank of Africa. We are indeed the African bank with the global reach. are your own person, unique, one of a kind, special. That's why you deserve everything tailored to suit your particular taste, your preference, your needs. Just like MTN Just For You. You can get customized offers tailored to who you are. Dial star 141 hash or use the My MTN app to get to choose from a variety of offers made just for you. Hey Charlie, what number? The Malaria will not be down, eh? Hey Charlie, no joke. Fever, headache, vomiting, loss of appetite. I couldn't even eat my usual fufu. <laughs> <laughs> you and your fufu. But I hope you got it tested before the malaria treatment. Yes, I did. And thanks to Malatu, I kicked out malaria one time. When malaria strikes, take Malatu, containing Arthometer and Lumifantrin. Comes in tablets and suspension for effective treatment of malaria. Great to have you back. Thank you. No problem. Mala 2 is suitable for adults and children. Manufactured and distributed by NS Chemist Limited. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. My name is C. I'm a person living with HIV. I got to know of my HIV status when I became pregnant. Since then, I have successfully been delivered of an HIV negative baby. Thanks to PMT City Services. I follow the guidelines and take my HIV medicine called ARVs every day to date. This makes me strong, helps me, and prevents me from passing HIV onto my baby. Please avail yourself for PMT City Services when pregnant. It is the only way to ensure that you do not transmit HIV onto your baby during pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. Even if you have tested for HIV recently and was negative, test again when pregnant. If you test positive, Take the baby back to the hospital immediately after birth, as directed by your healthcare provider. The baby will also be given medicine immediately after birth and tested to ensure that both mother and baby are well. Let's work together to have a generation free of HIV. Our children must be free to shine. Welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. Um, Kojo Yang Singh will be leading the team to take over from me at 12 uh, to continue with our comprehensive coverage of the NDC's presidential and parliamentary uh, primary elections. News File is live on Joy News Channel, it's on Joy FM, it's on Love FM in Kumasi, and several dozens uh, affiliates. It's also live, streaming live as well on your YouTube channel, and it's on the KTU radio in Koforidia, ATL FM in Cape Coast. Thank you very much for keeping your dials with us. And my guest you've been listening to so far, Professor Kweku Asari, University of Florida, 
uh, CDD Developments and Democratic Democracy and Development Fellow in Public Law and Justice. He's a member of the Florida Bar. Uh, professor Kujua PJ TI is Associate Professor, School of Law, University of Ghana, Legon. Dr. Kwame Asa Asante, who took us to some history in the making of the Constitution as far as the Committee of Experts are concerned. He's Senior Lecturer, Department of Political Science and Director, Center for European Studies, University of Ghana, Legon. Uh, we have difficulties uh, establishing contact with Dr. Benjamin Kumbo, visiting scholar, University of Ghana School of Law, who uh, was to also join us on the show. And uh, I'm not surprised about what Prof. Uh, Dr. Asa Asante is doing. Um, if when we were discussing Boku, you saw I brought a, a book, a huge book here that looked very old. It was a collection of stories of many years um, that he put together and shared some of them with me to gain deeper insights into the Boku situation. So when he goes to the Committee of Experts reports, I'm the least surprised about it. <laughs> right. Uh, Professor Asari, the first, uh, I know you want to make brief uh, remarks, particularly uh, in respect of the, the um, submissions made by Dr. Asar Sante. Uh, if you can do that within a minute, and then in not more than five minutes, we want to see what the distinctions are between uh, dual citizenship and allegiance, which is a major, you know, issue that comes up anytime this thing is raised. And I asked you the question earlier, how is one a dual citizen, a citizen of Ghana and another country, yet we can say that uh, that person <clears throat> cannot be said to owe allegiance to an, a country other than Ghana? Uh, on, briefly on uh, Prof's uh, submissions, uh, first, uh, what you read from the Committee of Experts report, um, the committee outlawed or the assembly outlawed dual citizenship. But in 1996, they reviewed the work and found out that that was too much, and that is why dual citizenship has been allowed. So that's what I call the first amendment. So mm. everything you read, it's not of relevance because it's been dated and we have moved on. Is Second, it rather not is it is it rather not of relevance? Is it rather not the case that it is of relevance in in pursuit of a reasonable narrow opportunity? Uh, it could be, but what I'm what I'm just saying that the committee of experts and the assembly basically indicated that dual citizenship is too dangerous to be allowed. And all I'm saying is that in four years, we went back and said, no, that is way too much. Let's allow dual citizenship because all of these fears that Prof was talking about uh, are just hypothetical and they are not something that we can use to outlaw uh, dual citizenship. And we are now completing that evolution to say, look, once we have allowed dual citizenship, and we have allowed them in our system for 30 years, it's now time to make another step, basically grant them uh, the right to participate fully in the political space. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about very quickly was that you mentioned that our institutions are weak. Come on, are, are institutions any weaker than that of Celerion or Nigeria or Senegal? Uh, and they allow their dual citizens to participate fully in their uh, political space. Look, I understand what Prof is saying, but I just want him to be a little modest when he's talking about other Ghanaians. Attributing this disloyalty to other Ghanaians, I believe is a little too much. Look, if you don't trust dual citizens, in fact, if you don't trust a politician, then the answer in our democracy is not to vote for them. And so I would be very happy if Prof would say, look, because S is a dual citizen, I'm not going to vote for him. I have no problem with that. And finally, on the question of presidency, remember there's a specific article in the Constitution that says to be a president, you have to be uh, a natural-born Ghanaian. So 
uh, only natural born Ghanaians mm. can be citizens. But, but, now, but prof, back prof, that's, to, that's, 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 does that not raise a real situation, practical? When he gives, he asks us the question. The mm -hmm. CDS, IGP, they will sit in security meetings with the president. And if they do, doesn't that open us to the practical situation a challenge? Because matters of national security. Yeah, yeah, because that's what I'm saying. There's the presumption that if you have the citizenship of another country, then somehow you cannot be trusted. And another uh, presumption that if you don't have the citizenship of another country, then you can be trusted. I just don't think that there are any facts, there's any evidence, there's any logic behind that beyond just religion. I mean, it's like, yes, I believe that. Mm. And so it must be. Okay. That, to me, is not the way we make laws. You cannot make a law and say, well, well I think poor people are going to be corrupt. Therefore, mm. poor people should be uh, restricted from holding public office. That okay, is so my point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In, in, in the next uh, five minutes, tell us about how different it is as I ask the question. Yeah. Now, it is important, very important, that even the question be framed properly. The question is not whether dual citizens owe allegiance to a country other than Ghana. No, that's not the question. The question is, what is the meaning of owing allegiance to a country other than Ghana as used in our constitution. That's what the question should revolve around. And that question, the clear answer is, it has nothing to do with citizenship. Why? Because in 1992, when the constitution was promulgated, Article 94.2a on allegiance was right in there but dual citizenship was not allowed. So it is a little curious to say Article 94.2a was meant to disqualify dual citizens, people who did not even exist in our political space. So we must do better and look for the real meaning of Article 94.2a rather than just say, well, a citizen owes allegiance, and therefore when I see allegiance in the Constitution, it must refer to citizenship. Using that analogy, then we can also argue that when a president takes the oath of allegiance, then he's taking an oath of citizenship. No, he's not taking an oath of citizenship. He's taking an oath of allegiance to defend, to maintain, and to protect the Constitution. That's what that oath of allegiance is. So now, once you understand that, then you have to figure out, well, what does it mean? to say you owe allegiance to a country other than Ghana as used in our constitution. The easiest way to answer that is to go to the 1968 memorandum on the proposals for a constitution. And the answer is right there in paragraphs 416 to 418. They mentioned that the allegiance clause is there because of occupational hazards. They are trying to restrict people whose occupation are incompatible with sitting in the house. So the way to define allegiance under Article 94.2 is a person whose occupation requires a pledge of allegiance to a country other than Ghana, and which occupation is deemed naturally incompatible with sitting in parliament. Mm. What would be an example of that? Well, somebody who is spying or who is a spy for another country against Ghana, good example will be Susubis and the swap of Piazza and Co, uh, where Piazza and Co, who were mono citizens, were spying for the US and so were deported to the US, even though they were not US citizens, and, uh, 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 and Susubis was repatriated. So spying. And then it was also, remember that allegiance is a feudal term. You can find it in the constitution of all Commonwealth countries. What it really means was, uh, it was targeted at war. People who served in the military of an enemy of a country. So things like that uh, are, are the reason why we have Article um, uh, 94 a And then here I will give you eight separate grounds, eight separate grounds for why I think they are different. One, as I mentioned, the principle of meaningful variation, right? Tells us that a word or phrase is presumed to bear the same meaning throughout a test. 
So dual citizenship in Article A2 cannot mean the same thing as uh, allegiance in Article 94.2. Number two, I've already discussed it. Article 94.2a predates Act 527, which is the first amendment which allowed dual citizenship. Thus, Article 94.2a cannot reasonably be referring to dual citizenship as a chronological matter. Three, I've mentioned the 1968 memorandum on the proposals for constitution of Ghana, in, which, is informed, which informed the draft of the 1992 constitution expressly categorizes allegiance to a country other than Ghana as occupation or transaction related, not citizenship related. Four, case laws such as Bilson versus Rawlings and others from other jurisdictions, several uh, citations I can give, support the distinction between allegiance as a disqualifying event and citizenship. So if you read uh, the Constitution of Canada, for instance, they have this uh, article on allegiance because they were uh, uh, part of the Commonwealth. But in Canada, even though they have uh, this um, provision on allegiance, you can be a dual citizen and sit in, in the parliament of Ghana. Likewise, people don't realize that right after independence, right after independence, all Ghanaians were dual citizens when we passed the Nationality Act. Why? Well, because before we passed the Nationality Act, Ghanaians were British citizens, British protected persons, British subjects, and Commonwealth uh, citizens. Now, when we passed our own nationality law, we all became dual citizens. Mm. So there are many Ghanaians who are dual citizens as a result of that colonial heritage. And everyone who was running Ghana in those days was a dual citizen, yet we survived. Uh, now, I also want people to look at Article 94.2, not just the A, but Article 94.2, A to G, to see the character of things that are included in that article. You would see that the article should be applied to persons who have engaged in severe allegiance-based misconduct that has been adjudged to be a threat to the security of the state or otherwise inimical to its interest. Right. So if you read Article 94.2, it has things like it has, uh, disqualifies people who have been convicted for high crime, for mm. prison, for mm. felony, and so on and so forth. Are we then saying that dual citizenship, which is a lawful status, is in the same category as these other things that are mentioned in Article 94.2? Mm. No, it couldn't be. In fact, anybody doing something lawful should not be penalized the way Article 94.2a penalizes okay. citizens. Mm. All right. The, uh, I've mentioned that the sheer breadth of exclusions, the number of positions that are excluded, uh, suggests that allegiance should be construed narrowly to vindicate modern views of citizenship and constitutional values of equal citizenship. And then I've already talked about the 1957 Constitution. If you go to Section 25.2, it had a clause on allegiance, yet everybody was a dual citizen. And that right there should also tell them something. Mm -hmm. And then the last point, uh, why the allegiance clause is found in the constitution of all Commonwealth countries, successful use of the clause to disqualify a citizen from holding is very difficult, if not impossible, to find. That clause is something that we either interpret it carefully because mm. it was a dormant clause. Right. Nobody even knew about Article 94 to a right. until we passed the law on dual citizenship. And then all of a sudden, it's okay. being uh, misapplied to that. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Kwekwasari. Uh, and uh, we're looking for the, the time when uh, we will have you live around in town and then we could, we could sit here and do like a whole hour, just one-on-one, -on -one, uh, bringing further light and uh, elucidation on this subject. But please hang on there. Don't leave yet. Uh, Professor um, Apieje has to take leave of us. And we want to hear him on the subject to which we are going to now before he can take leave of us. I have several comments on the question of dual citizenship and the allegiance question, uh, some from very prominent citizens that I'll share with you. So don't go anywhere, just hang in there. Now, uh, Professor APJ, the, the, the President Mahama in his campaign spoke, he was very clear about it, we'll share the, the, the video shortly, that they will give jobs in the security to party people. 
the NPP's response is that, yes, we do this, but we do it quietly. You don't have to say it publicly. And I'll share also a reaction from the NPP's uh, communications director. And you know that it's not me saying, but this is a clear admission. In fact, you can't run away from it. <laughs> um, the commission, Ayawasu West Wagon, had issue with this situation and cautioned against it. It said that party faithful are resettled through the national security establishment. Their mere presence encourages opposition parties to counter their activities. National security agencies should be nonpartisan and founded on an object's uh, loyalty to the state. Partisan appointments into national security violate Section 15 of the Security and Intelligence Act, Act 526. Partisan appointments affect confidence in the security agencies. What do you make of this situation and what should be done about it, Prof? Thank you, Samson. Um, this is a very uh, worrying situation uh, because we are jeopardizing the security of the state and we are redefining national security to, re to, to mean regime security. That is how I'll, I'll simply put it. And we also look at it from not as a security, just as a security issue, but as a securitization issue, where um, we, we, um, the, the political power emerges as existential threats and therefore uses the security apparatus to um, to to quell the situation or to justify why more money and more resources should go into security issues. And this extends to who should go into the security apparatus, that is party apparatchik and foot soldiers and so on. So it is a worrying trend because national security is something that should be based on professionalism, should be based on people who have the competence and the qualification. Imagine the uh, Ayawasi Wogon situation where somebody has had two weeks of security training and he was he became part of the national security apparatus. Mm. And so um, it's interesting that NPP is saying we, we all do it, but we do it on the on the on the uh, in secret. It is something that needs to we need to all pay serious attention to, so that it's a question of national security, not regime security. And what um, Mahama said is condemnable, and what the NPP also said is condemnable. Um, for example, I heard that um, the, the Delta Force and other um, um, elements in the NPP have been incorporated into... It, the, it was a the, promise that was made to them. And when there was a delay in fulfilling the promise of sort of in integrating them, so to speak, for want of a better word, we saw what they did. When yes. appointments were made that were made outside of their membership, they went, you know, and brutalized, humiliated the individual involved in Kumasi. And we saw what mm -hmm. happened even in a courtroom in yeah. Ghana. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, that's what... Um, the NPP, um, the NDC is now saying that we will do political equalization, and they are saying it openly. And so it tells you about what goes on behind the scenes, which is now coming out, whether it's um, confession time or something. But to me, I think my, uh, um, President, former President Mahama knows what he's saying. He's appealing to the base of the party to tell them that you vote for me, this is what I'm going to do for you. Mm. And so clearly, it is not a good sign. And it, I think we also need to look at it from the from how governments in power uh, cozy it up with um, the soldiers and other security agencies. It all boils down to the fact that they'll be able to um, um, penetrate these agencies and brought in their people in there. So even when they do something wrong, referring to a shaman as a more recent incident, they are not ready to um, apply the whip and to ensure that discipline is maintained in the force. And that is a warning sign because the security agencies are a critical component of our democratic uh, system. They are able to check the excesses that 
um, governments uh, make so that they will, they will protect the security of the state as a whole and protect our democracy. But if they are infiltrated and compromised, then there's uh, another basis to worry about a key important element of ensuring the stability of our democracy being eroded. Thank you very much for your time this morning, uh, Professor uh, Kujo Apieje Etia, Associate Professor at the University of Ghana uh, School of Law. Uh, we still have uh, Dr. Asa Santo with us and um, uh, Professor uh, Kwekwasari also on the line um, to help us to determine what ought to be done. So I'm asking the question to myself. <laughs> Pro, uh, Prof just said a while ago, um, this is what they do and it's condemnable. Um, f f what, they say, what they are saying is, un is condemnable. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Are we saying we are, we are okay with them if they, they hide and do it secretly? We certainly cannot be. Certainly, we cannot endorse that. That position was actually wrong. And um, it's not the first time. It's gradually becoming a feature in Ghanaian politics. And it has all uh, its effect on the political stability of this country. Let me take you a little back to history. Um, these um, practices have found expression in two ways. Sometimes they play the ethnic card within the security uh, services, putting certain ethnic groups in there, or uh, they make it also taking party people in. Uh, the history of it could be traced to um, long to Nkrumah's era, where Nkrumah was accused of having surrounded himself with his Nzema people, mm. a security uh, kapus, Ambrose, uh, Derry, and the rest of them. Mm. They accused Okam Nkrumah of having surrounded himself with a lot of security um, people uh, who belong to the Nzema uh, ethnic group. Rollins' time, um, uh, similar uh, allegations were made against Rollins that um, within the army, they've had a lot of what people from a certain ethnic group, uh, particularly ever, mm. to the extent that the late MP, my late MP, Jari Labi, in the year 2000, filed a motion in parliament uh, that the way they were enlisting people into the army was based on a certain um, a trend which was not reflective of regional balance. Uh, even though that motion was defeated, but brought to the fore that problem that really exists uh, within the political space. Kufo's time, uh, such allegations were made, and uh, Nana Kufuado time, we have seen uh, this. Um, if you look at these things uh, within the body politics, right, uh, one of the things that have brought these things sharply to sharp focus is the issue of what? Law and ethics, right? Um, if you look at, if you want to really uh, put people into the security service, it's nothing but meritocracy mm -hmm. and merit. People go in there because they qualify, they have the professional qualification, they have the competence, they have what? The experience and what have you. Any other consideration is no, no, no. But here you are. You see party people pushing their men in there. And the reason why they do this is one, for political expediency, that they can make use of them anytime they need them to create all manner of what are problems for the society and uh, also to satisfy their paymasters and the rest of them. Uh, more often than not, uh, they use them also uh, to terrorize society, mm. abuse society, and uh, these things, uh, if uh, it's not checked, is going to create all manner of problems. Mm. The dangers. So, I'm, I'm going to hold on with the dangers. You come and want to outline them and, and ask what must be done. Even a commission's report has been ignored. And right after elections, we see what happens in this country. Is this thing really about just the security services? Don't we know in this town that <laughs> it's not different any, for any public office? But what are we doing to the politicians? What are they doing to this country? 
Now, listen to um, the, the former president, what exactly he said, then his aide, Joyce Bar Mutari, how she defended the circumstance, and um, Ahiaba, the MPP's communications director, how he also, um, s what he also said about it. Let's be very, very realistic here. Mm. We should not in any way raise the bar of National Democratic Congress and show that what we need to do is to put the NPP to the litmus test on all the key facets that they pledged to do upon assumption of office ever. You live here with me on corruption, on media freedom for press freedom, on employment for persons of, you know, without any discrimination in terms of access, in terms of building a better economy, in terms of managing our health institutions, in terms of providing roads, water, electricity, all the things that you and I desire. The worst part is that that same economy that is promised to better money, we have literally gone aground. The country is currently bankrupt. So please, once we are in here, we know what we've gone through. We know what we have suffered. Look, I had a very, very, very interesting encounter of a young boy who gained admission into one of the uniform agencies. He was denied access largely because he was unable to prove the fact that he was a member of the New Patriotic Party. Positioning and the posturing of saying that, oh, something, something untoward has happened or something wrong has happened. And as a result of it, we are going to break the law. For me, I find that very laughable. And, and in building a democratic institution, we shouldn't be having this conversation. I think that the, the former president bespoke. If I were speaking for him, that would be my position, that he's, he misspoke. And that is not what he intend. Try to explain and and put a better spin on this. But to to entrench your position to say that yes, we say that and we mean it. I find, I find it very disturbing. In making a, a proposition for a forward leadership, I think that the best posturing of the NDC and therefore the former president should be that these are things we observe to be wrong, and we think that we can fix it. Right? But it is not the case, in the case of the police recruitment and the rest, that there is an intentional effort to recruit party people in a manner the president is suggesting in his speech. Right. So, John Mahama said, quote, our people, our branch executives' children, you just, you just stand by. If we are distributing any jobs, if we are recruiting people into the police, so it starts actually with any jobs, <laughs> people into the police, the army, the prison service, the fire service, and the immigration service. And guys, let's not play ostrich about this. The army, the police, prison service, fire service, immigration, national security, the parties, they just ship their guys into it every election cycle. So he says, we will recruit all of our young people too to go and work. So what did Harry Raidrisu have to say about this? He said, MPP government was recruiting party supporters into the security services. Future NDC government will reverse the unlawful recruitment. So what has changed? Or two different people speaking. And we are not paying attention to the, uh, I am also West we're gone, the eminent panel, uh, ML Shorts, uh, Professor Justice Henry Tamensa Bonsu, why did we give them the job if we didn't mean to follow what they would say? Prof, what uh, are the dangers? The dangers are that, one, uh, it leads to um, a situation where we tend to polarize the already volatile political system uh, by putting in party apparatchiks into the security setup 
Uh, we also create unnecessary tension within the country. Because sometimes when you see the activities, you and I witness uh, the way people pounce on judges, a judge sitting doing uh, her work, and you see groups like this bouncing, and nothing happens. The and group, the group went to, I think the harbor. They went to do something in Tema, yeah. and a lawyer of such a long standing, who was then the NPP's chairman, mm -hmm. Freddie Blay, mm -hmm. defended them and said they were preserving public property. They went there to, on their own, remove, drive people out of the place. And he said they were doing a job that the Constitution expects them to do, preserve public property and defend <laughs> public property. When you do things of this nature, it leads to nothing but impunity. You open the floodgate for people to commit similar or other egregious offenses. Simply because the, those who manage the political affairs of the state will always come into their defense. And some of these things go a long way to undermine, especially the core within the army. The army work as an, a uniform institution where they believe in their colors, their ranks, the, the command model work. So any other things that deviate from this create unnecessary what problem for them. One of the reasons that every Fa Enko um, leveled again, reasons that the accusation they made against the Nkoma government was some of that that Nkoma tried to what uh, simplify that is the simplification of the Ghana army, <laughs> bringing a CPP branch within the army and all that. Simplification. <laughs> yeah, simplification. <laughs> That's what Okwe described mm. in his book. Simplification. Of I don't know what we can say of the current situation. <laughs> then it's going to be a simplification of the, the security mm. service. Once you have that, uh, you divide the, the, the soldiers, uh, you don't build a solid uh, force that will stand and defend the country at all times. Respect for command. Yes. Um, it, it's, you, you said something, and I just want to chip in this. Mm. It also leads to some of these things, a strengthening what we call ethnic power relations within the state. That's right. And it goes beyond even the security services. You find it in all workplaces as a particular group of people, either from a political stock or from an ethnic group. And these things do not bode well for a democracy mm. uh, that has suffered a lot of what? Injustice, a lot of problems that we are trying to nurture and protect at all times. And um, it also uh, creates all manner of problems that undermine the stability of this country. Because as soon as you compromise the security of the country, you are already creating uh, a fertile grounds for all manner of problems. In your mind, so, what can we do to stop this yes. now? The, the, the way out, a number of suggestions that I want to make is that uh, let us force political parties to put these things into their manifesto so that we can hold them to it. That's their policy, one way. Uh, you recall when we started experiencing this power outages and all that, the dooms or era, uh, groups such as AGI and Co called, you know, political parties, can you come over Tell us your solution to this problem and put into the manifesto quickly. Uh, it began to feature in some of the manifestos, and today we are getting... Uh, How are you going to police that? Already, subscribe service tells us the unemployment situation is that bad. These people are Ghanaians, first, first off. How are you going to police the process and say, uh, this person being brought here uh, was a foot soldier, doing this and he is earning his employment into the security service on account of the political affiliation. We don't need to break heads on these things. The, the, the army uh, leadership, they have a way of profiling everybody. They know who to select and how to select them. It's easy. If you will leave them to do their work, obviously they will be able to fish out all these people and get those who are, you know, without this coloration to be in the army. The leaders complain only privately to some of us. Yes. They complain privately. They don't complain publicly yes. that the politicians are forcing these people onto them. Yes. They and sometimes the, the way the, 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 the promotional system, yeah. the things they are forced to do. Yes, yes. It's a difficult one. But the good news is that they share with some of us 
So the advocacy must go on so that we strengthen their hand to do what we did. That also brings to the fore as to the appointment of the, 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 the service commanders mm. and all that. Should it be in the hands of the head of state, for instance? Well, they need people they can be comfortable with once they come into office. That, that conversation, I mm. think we have to also bring it to the table and look at it again as to service commandment. Uh, appointment and all that. You go to other jurisdictions, you realize that some of the security uh, people are, you know, appointed as like private people and then they operate on behalf of the state. Is that something we can emulate and then practice it here? Uh, the, the, the also, one thing that we always forget that we can say all these things, but we as citizens, when we, we sleep on our right to punish those who engage us. In this, um, when we leave them like that, they will continue to do what we're. And doing. then you are punishing all of them because they are equally guilty. Why not? Is it wrong? <laughs> Is it wrong? But sometimes it becomes so difficult. But I'm saying that let us set example at least once. Once we do that, it becomes a learning curve mm. for the rest to follow. Uh, well, there are a host of other things, but we believe mm. that we should be vigilant on mm. these things, mm. and then so as to make sure. Uh, that we can save this state, but polarization of the mm. army or the security service in whatever form, either through ethnicity or through political party machinations and all that, will not bode well for an army that has served this country for a very long time, continue to serve as good. We don't need to compromise their standards. Maybe, maybe uh, is it the PPP and the other parties? They should give us reason because these parties are all guilty. Unfortunately, and and they will do it anyway. Yeah, unfortunately, anyway. none of the other small parties. Let, let's people. let's hear what uh, Professor Kukwasari has to say about it, and um, I'll share some of your messages also with the rest of the world shortly. And remember that. Um, the, um, your election headquarters is bringing you uh, the continuing coverage, comprehensive, of the NDC um, parliamentary and presidential primaries. You don't get it uh, as any better. Um, now, this show is brought to you by Bank of Africa, strong as a group, close as a partner, empty and everywhere you go. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Robert and Sons of Car Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for 31 years. My Way Insurance, dial star 165 hash on MTN to, go, to join. Duroplast, how you get your water matters. Remember, where Duroplast goes, water flows. And DBS Industries, roofing. Pa, 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 fie. Um, yes, uh, Professor Kukwasari, what, what do you have to say about this? Particularly, how do we, do we stop this? Now, Samson, it comes down to the way we have accepted to do politics. The way we have accepted to do politics can only breed problems. Uh, look, this issue is not just about the security sector. It's the politi politicization of the whole public service. And it's not an overnight phenomenon. This is something that has been going on for three decades. And it's just going to weaken our constitutional buffers. You know, people don't trust the media. People don't trust the Electoral Commission. People don't trust the courts, and so on and so forth. Why? Well, because of the way we've done politics, because of the way we push uh, politicians uh, political apparatus into these institutions. There was a time in Ghana when we really could trust our public service. So I recall people like Jeke Daku, the director of public prosecutions. Everybody knew him, and he stood for what was right. No, the attorney general did not direct how he should do his work. There was Justice Aban, who was the electoral commissioner under Unigov. A champion went to him, he said, no, I'm not going to declare results that you want, you know, even uh, at the a, a risk of my own life. There was the SID, people investigating the murder of the judges against tremendous risk, but they did their job. And we have, under this fourth republic, weakened our public service uh, to such an extent that we are now undermining democracy, we are undermining our national security. And if you are not careful, the consequences could be disastrous. It is time to write a public officer's ethics act 
that define and delineate areas that uh, uh, politicians can go and cannot go to. I, I cannot understand why politicians are involved in the recruitment of people to the security service. I cannot understand why a CEO of a state-owned enterprise can come and sit on TV and do politics. It, 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 it's unthinkable to me. I cannot understand why somebody who works in the media can be appointed to the board of a state-owned enterprise. These are all subtle ways of corrupting our institutions, and the end result is what we are seeing. This is a country that has become increasingly polycratic. Too many people in the public sector are not on merit. It has become <laughs> a country uh, where yeah. we are basically, I would say, yeah. we are suffering from uh, kakistocracy and even kleptocracy. And these things are not happening by chance. They are happening because of the way we do politics. You cannot, as a politician, say you are going to come in and give jobs to uh, your tribe people. You cannot say you are going to give jobs to your religious people. But you can say openly, publicly, and nobody even uh, says a word. When I come, I'm going to take care of my foot soldiers. How can you be running for president and going around campaigning that when you come, you take care of your foot soldiers? Are you running to be president of your party or are you running for, to be president of your country? It has gotten to some stage. I used to be very, very, very active in politics. But these days, I'm even ashamed to, to seem to be doing politics because I just think the way we do politics is horribly wrong. And we got to do political party reform. We got to do campaign finance reform. We really got to control this problem. Because if, if, we, are, if we don't do that, we, we are sitting on a, a time bomb. Mm. So, so hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I let me share just a few messages um, um, with you. There are some people who a number of messages. I just box them together. That we should pray that this same mentality does not uh, take over the judiciary as far as appointments they are concerned um, on the dual uh, citizenship matter. Um, isn't it funny that under our law, a dual citizen cannot be a colonel in command of a military unit, but every one of his or her subordinates, the actually fighting men in battle, can all be dual citizens? <laughs> What's wrong with us? At best, Article 4094-2A could not only have had naturalized citizens in mind, not natural-born Ghanaians who had subsequently acquired the citizenship of another country. Because, as my good uh, pal, uh, Professor Asari, has eloquently explained the latter status, a birth citizen, Ghanaian, who is a dual citizen, is a status that wasn't permitted in the same original constitution in which we find Article 94.2a. Um, okay, Gifty says that I guess the biggest problem is how people can engineer electoral victory sometimes through uh, monetization. I have a bit of a funny feeling about this, but I'm sure we'll get to a position that works someday. Because uh, if people can influence elections, opening it up that way means even the people, uh, the people's will can be subverted through engineered victory and other things. I hope it makes sense uh, what I'm saying. Um, so, for example, when uh, Matthew Poku Prempe showed up for the first time in Mensha, the refrain was, was that this was a man who was coming from abroad with money. <laughs> so he could afford to buy <laughs> to buy the the primaries. Uh, so people from abroad will make the money and just come and buy. Koko Njubuesako is commenting about my not impounding the vehicle thing and how he feels that is deliberate on the part of the officials who do that kind of thing. 
guys, it doesn't look good on you. Just stop. It's only the uniform that separates you from us. You don't know where you'll be tomorrow. Do the right thing by the citizens. And then, uh, the, this is from YK Ansa Yebua. He says that, uh, Samson, don't waste your time in this political gimmickry uh, by dual citizenship by these uh, NDC MPP politicians. They are doing it just for the votes. Even simple voting by Ghanaians living abroad, they won't do it since 2006. Um, well, so the court issued an order compelling that the, say, an order of mandamus that the EC should take a law to uh, a CI to Parliament so that the modalities will be rolled out. Uh, after a year when they, were, they hadn't done it, my client cited them for contempt. They came and begged, and the courts gave them one more year. That has not been done. Let's see what they will do subsequently. I've got a few more of your messages here, but time just ran out on us. Uh, my outfit, as always, is by Latida. Uh, sorry, by Habil Scooter. Habil Scooter. You'll find them at Ajirengano Gates. Thank you very much. Um, join me tomorrow, Sunday at 2 p.m. on The Law, uh, which is our weekly legal clinic. I'm hosting Oliver Bakavomawo, lawyer and researcher, and Kofi Yeboa, General Secretary of the Ghana Journalist Association, to look at free, uh, press freedom versus false crimes. Thank you to our guests for your time and for helping us with the insightful uh, discussions that we have had this morning. Dr. Kwame Asasante, Senior Lecturer, Department of Political Science and Director, Center for European Studies, University of Ghana. Dr. Kujua PAJ, Chia, Associate Professor, um, School of Law, University of Ghana, Ligon, and Professor Stephen Kwekuasari, University of Florida, CDD, Deve De Democracy and Development Fellow in Public Law and Justice, member of the Florida Bar. Uh, we started with Dr. Eduan Anienpi of the former Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission and Convener of the Pensioner Bondholders Forum. Thank you also very much, Kojo Yangsen, and the crack team uh, join you right away to continue with a comprehensive coverage of the NDC's uh, parliamentary and presidential uh, primaries. Have a good afternoon. MTN. Everywhere you go.